dollars. I've asked all the coin dealers in the exhibit hall to make sure they have a silver dollar because if you buy a silver dollar, one or more, you bring it to the closing panel on Saturday and we have a picture where you come up on stage with Steve Forbes and our other celebrities, maybe even Robert Kennedy, and we will take a picture together holding this symbol of liberty. So be sure to do that. Today is going to be a fantastic day. We have our Global Economic Summit. We have a lot of breakout sessions. We have our luncheon with Tulsi Gabbard and uh, uh, Enos Kander, Freedom. Uh, there's lots of events going on, especially our breakout sessions, so you don't want to miss those. So who is our MC? None other than Kennedy. So let's welcome Lisa Kennedy as our MC extraordinary. And look at this beautiful outfit. Oh, my gosh. Hi, everyone. How are we? Are we caffeinated? Are we rejuvenated? Are we hydrated? That's one of the most important things, especially in a, a humid city. You don't realize uh, the nutritional needs that you have, especially in terms of, you know, rejiggering the system in the liver after a night. So the liquid IV, the Gatorade, whatever you can do, Pedialyte, get it in your system now because you're going to want to be as sharp as attack. Today is a big day. And uh, this is one of the most important ways that we can launch the first full day of Freedom Fest. Are you ready for the Global Economic Summit? Oh, I love to hear it. Well, moderating the panel is a very smart and learned young man. He went to two of my favorite schools as an official Hoosier and Indiana girl. He has degrees from Purdue and IU, Indiana University as well as Johns Hopkins and Northwestern. So the man has been all over the map. Uh, he started at Money Map Press in 2011 as an economist and researcher, and now he runs the whole damn thing, and hopefully one day the world with limited government, liberty-minded people who want to take the globe back from the globalists and the technocrats. So without further ado, let's launch into the Global Economic Summit with Garrett Baldwin. Enjoy. The best things in life are free, but you can give them to the birds and bees. I want the money. That's what I want. I'm Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's having a great day. My name is Garrett Baldwin. I am the executive publisher of Money Map Press and Republic Research. There were some rumors going around that some people were upset because the bar at the Sheridan closed at 10.15 last night. I just want to tell you that that might be a cosmic welcome because, as you know, if you remember in college, economics was always taught before 9 o'clock in the morning. So be very content. I'm happy that everybody is here. We're going to break into this and just jump in. Steve Forbes, everybody, no introduction needed. He's the chairman and editor of Forbes Media. His new podcast, What's Ahead, engages top newsmakers, politicians, and business pioneers. And he is an uh, absolute expert on the intersection of politics, society, and economics. Steve, I'm going to start with you. You're the presidential candidate in 1996 and 2000, so everything that is wrong afterward, that is all of our fault. The United States Heritage Economic Freedom Index has ranked the United States 25th overall. We were 8th in 2008. What went wrong, and how do we right this ship? Uh, what r went r wrong is uh, government. Uh, to a fare thee well, uh, the far left is making a determined effort to turn the United States into some version of a European stagnant economy. And uh, they are relentless in every way. They are practicing what you might call modern socialism. You know, the socialists in the days of old thought you had to seize assets, nationalize things. The modern socialist is much smarter. 
those socialists realize you don't need to seize things you just make sure you regulate them in a way in which their existence depends on the whims of bureaucrats and washington politicians and you see this in the case of our president you know he still makes statements occasionally uh, and uh, but it doesn't matter the far left runs those bureaucracies those so-called independent agencies and you see the regulations everywhere whether it's uh, forcing us to use EVs when only about one out of ten want to do it. You see it the war on fossil fuels. You see it on the war on shower heads, air conditioners, gas stoves, and uh, every, everything else. Dishwashers now takes ten hours to do what, what a dishwasher could do one hour a few years ago. Anything that makes life worth living and more pleasurable, they're again. And you see it in New York City in pizzas, for crying out loud. They're now going after of pizzas made from wood-burning and coal-burning stoves, which have been around for decades. They say, this is to save the environment. No, it isn't. It's to shaft New Yorkers and force them to move. However, they are now want a war on air conditioners, so if you do move, you're going to sweat to death in places like Texas and Florida. But in the thing about New York, I think this epitomizes what's happening in terms of the loss of freedom. On the pizzas, they say, well, they emit emissions, you know, carbon dioxide. However, as somebody pointed out, John Kerry's aircraft, if you take that, those emissions, over 100,000 tons a year, it would take a typical wood-burning stove 849 years to match the emissions of what John Kerry does in one year, flying around telling us how bad we are. And, and, and and, and, and in the days of old, as you know, in medieval times, uh, you could buy, when the church was corrupt, you could buy what they call indulgences. And that is, if you were a sinner, you could uh, make a, a contribution, and that would guarantee you a smooth ride to heaven. Uh, so what they do, the modern version of, 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 of indulgences, is they say, uh, carbon offsets. What are carbon offsets? They say, we're making contributions to study climate change. Doesn't wash. You are emitting period, just as those sinners were sinning, period, and no amount of money was going to get you around <laughs> it. But it just all goes to show they all want central planning. They all want low growth. They don't care about growth rates. They care about control. And you see it in the Federal Reserve. It is accepted by even many conservatives, the idea that the Fed can control and guide the economy. They can't. How Central planning doesn't work. And yet they manipulate interest rates, which is a form of rent control. We know rent control, what that does to a, to a real estate market. Well, look what they did in the last 15 years. Zero interest rates, free money. Governments loved it. The politicians loved it because they could spend and the cost of the debt went down. It would be like charging $10,000 to your credit card and the monthly payment went down. What was they, they loved it. And then inflation comes along and oopsie-daisy, you got a crisis on your hands. Companies, free money. A lot of them borrowed to a fairly well. Now they're in trouble. Consumers, a lot of them are now in trouble. So, so what, uh, the reason the index is declining, and I'm surprised we're still number 25, and then I realize every, a lot of other countries are doing <laughs> crazy things too. So it's not as if it's a wisdom index. It's, right. it's, it's a measure index, not but, a wisdom index. And, 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 and so, and so uh, it's no, and this is why the 2024 elections in conclusion are so important. Where is the United States going to go? Are we going to go forward? with the kind of principles and policy that made us a nation that attracted people who wanted, as Lincoln put it, to improve their lot in life and create great things and do great things? Or are we going to become a stultifying, no offense to Europe, but you're, that's what, Barbara, we've got to make, that, that, that's why we've got to make you head of the We're EU. Uh, 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 stultifying where no, no risks are taken. You stultify, the bureaucracies multiply, and we stagnate, and we continue to lose freedoms. Let's talk a little bit about that. The process, in one word, is dirigism, which is a French term. Let's talk about Europe. Dr. Barbara Kalm is the president of the Hayek Institute, founding director of Austrian Economic Center, and the Austrian Central Bank director. All right. Let's dig into this. Post-COVID, what do you think has – what countries in Europe have done it right when it comes to economic freedom and progress, and what do you think have done it wrong? Well, more or less all of them have done it wrong, put it this way. We are – literally in a decline. We've been in a, not only in a technical recession, we are in a recession ever since Q3 of last year. 
and the numbers literally don't look good. And there are single countries like hung Hungary that is bashed by many, uh, but they did at least uh, with regards to their uh, defense of individual freedom a lot. Uh, the Swedes did it much better than many other countries in, in continental Europe, but more or less uh, the rest has all followed the same trap or, and we have lost our individual freedom. So if you, can, you could summarize Europe in, in the following way, we have outsourced our energy supply to Russia, we have outsourced our production of industry production, cheap uh, industry goods to China, and we have outsourced our security to the US. And so what is left for Europe? I mean, nothing, to be honest. We museums. have museums and beautiful landscapes. Bicycles. And, and 24 million uh, small and medium-sized enterprises who actually carry the burden uh, of, tax of, of t high taxation uh, and, of course, who are innovative and creative. So this is the only hope that we have those uh, small, medium-sized family-owned or enterprises with 300, 400, 500 people who are really, in many ways, uh, upfront in, in, um, in innovation, but uh, all over the rest is, as you mentioned already, central uh, planning. And Hayek would spin in his grave. If he, if he knew what was happening. We have, but we have two central planners. We have central pl planning in Brussels, mm -hmm. and we have central planning in, 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 in Frankfurt at the European mm -hmm. Central Bank. I mean, we, just fin we finally go back to normalization of, uh, of monetary policy. But first of all, way too late and way too little. I mean, we are lagging behind the Fed, who did not do a great job either. Um, I'm not, I'm not here to, to criticize the Fed, but um, I just may say uh, we did it in Europe just one year too late, and uh, we're just still rising interest rates. But, you know, what is our star, the natural mm -hmm. interest rate? Now, this is the price for money. And if it's still negative, what do you expect from people? All right. So this doesn't look good for us. I want to introduce Priti Upala. She is a great thought leader, absolute media rock star, and the advisor to the Europe-India Chamber of Commerce and Industry. As you look at India and China, you look at the current situation, where do you see progress? Where do you see India moving forward? Uh, will be the, uh, right now on pace to be the second largest economy within the next couple of decades. How does, how does inf India influence the, uh, the global economy? Well, good morning, everyone, and lovely to be here again. Uh, don't have great news for you. Global growth is not looking good. Um, it tops at 3% next year, and you break it down, Europe, uh, uh, UK, forget about it, it's 0.4%, I think, and US, I mean, lucky to get over 1%. I love talking about the Asian markets because they're, you know, quite dynamic in, in comparison. Uh, I'll talk both about India and China. We'll start with India. It remains the fastest growing economy in the world post-COVID and post-conflict, I want to say. Um, growing at 6.5% this year and predicted to grow between 6 and 7 over the next five years consistently, which is remarkable for any economy under the current uh, economic environment. Um, its GDP, it's headed to five trillion by 2025. I think that's a, the best um, guesstimate. And uh, yes, it should be the third largest in a few years and, and uh, maybe in, in a decade or so, uh, maybe the second largest. So, I mean, the stage is set for India. It's got all the right ingredients, um, but I think, um, uh, and it seems like everybody has signed up for the Indian story, which is great. And I think uh, there was none better evidence than when the Prime Minister visited uh, the U.S. Uh, recently and the White House rolled out the red carpet like nobody's business, which is great. It's great to see the largest and the oldest democracies working together. I think that partnership really is going to be the most important one in the next half of the century. Um, and I always say it's the Asian century, but uh, I think India is going to play uh, a key role. The semiconductor chip race is really the most important race in the world right now. Whoever um, dominates the chip 
industry will really dictate the geopolitics of our time. And everybody's vying for it. I think India would want to be a pivotal player in repositioning the uh, uh, semiconductor global supply chains. Um, it would have to work with the market leader like Taiwan for that to happen. It's very early days for India, but I think it's headed in the right direction. Data is the new oil. Chips are the new gold. So this is the world that we find ourselves in. Just very quickly on China. China is a lot more complicated than India, uh, growing at 5.4% 5, 5 and predicted to grow at 5% next year. Unfortunately, um, their economy is at the risk of uh, deflation. So it, you know, prices are going to come down, which means they won't be spending as much. Uh, it's not good for an already downward spiraling economy. Property prices as well as their exports are seeing a steep decline. Recovery is very slow. The government might want to step in, which is never a good thing. And I think beyond just numbers, the post-COVID, there seems to be like the Chinese fatigue that set in, at least in the West. And um, geopolitical tensions are making countries really look for alternatives. And we will see that. It'll, it will not happen overnight because I think They've cemented their um, place in manufacturing and global supply chains. But I feel like the whole world should work in tandem to organically wean itself off of China. So that's where the world is at. Not looking pretty, but let's hope for the best. <laughs> I just spent some time in Switzerland, and uh, I'm looking out into the world of you know, places that I could be optimistic about. While I was driving down the road, a friend of mine said, what do you notice about the vehicles? I said, well, they're all very expensive. He said, well, no, look very closely. And it was no bumper stickers on any of the cars because no one wanted to put any political slogans on an $85,000 car, unlike here in the US. If we look at the current status of the world, Steve, is there anywhere that you look at it and you say, they're doing it right, we should emulate some of their policies? I think, uh, I think the, the, just working. I think the, the answer is uh, right here in the United States. You have, uh, the, as Dickens had the tale of two cities. Here we have the tale of two states, or two groups of states, red and blue. This is the virtue of the U.S. federal system, is that you have a number of states pursuing low taxes, pro-business, individual opportunity, parents now in many states controlling the money for the education of their kids, in schools, so you can choose anything, anywhere you want. <clears throat> and so this is, what, this is going to make a sharp contrast to 2024. Red state versus blue. And this is why I'm optimistic about the U.S. once we get to past 2024, is precisely we have the largest states like California, Florida, Tennessee, and others showing that individual freedom, the foundation of this country, is the way to go. And uh, Gavin Newsom, governor of California, handsome guy, that's about it. Uh, you know, how, 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 to do, how, how to burn a state down with bad land management, how to create an artificial water crisis. You know, California, this is an aside, this is how the stupidity of expert regulation. They flush every year half of their natural rainfall into the Pacific Ocean. Only 10% of that annual rainfall goes for commerce and for residential use. 40% for agriculture, the rest is wasted. So when you hear about a water crisis, no, that's a politician regulatory crisis. So wherever it is, burning land, electricity, what's that? Any high taxes, driving people out, he wants to run on that? Come on, guy, we're, we're, we're ready for you. I don't care who the nominee is. <clears throat> there is one other thing uh, with regards to Swiss cars. Uh, they don't have green license plates, which means uh, <laughs> they don't follow the net zero and right. no green energy. Whereas, you know, as we talked about Europe and uh, the decline of, the, of Europe, uh, Germany is literally dead. I mean, we have killed our car industry. Imagine when we were le the leading place in the world with car technology. Mm -hmm. And now uh, those plants have to close thanks to green policies, thanks to these politicians yep. who rather believe that money comes, uh, comes out of thin air or the copy machine 
and, and electricity just out of the plug, full stop. And we are not only destroying our competitiveness, Europe is, is outrun. Yeah. And where are they sending their manufacturing centers? They're moving to Texas and Louisiana, where we have cheap which natural is, gas. Which is great for them. And obviously China. You were talking earlier backstage with me about central bank digital yeah. currencies. Tell us your kind of overview right now, what your expectations are moving forward with central banks around the world trying to implement CDBCs. Well, there is um, huge differences. Uh, the Fed actually has, has stepped back on that um, and is not following through that on that front right now. Uh, the most advanced, to be honest, we just came back from a mission in China and saw Pan, the, the new the new big uh, man in, in, the, in the People's Bank of China. Uh, he will be the next governor. And um, they are as really advanced. They will put it into place. It's actually already up and running. And they have the wholesales and retail digital currencies. They have uh, all the business models in place. They will also use it for foreigners, interestingly enough, uh, for those. And um, the, they, we, we looked into their uh, technical parts. Europe will wants to do the CBDCs. I'm not a big, big fan of CBDCs. I'm a fan of cash and uh, uh, alternatives, uh, put it this way. And um, I also would like to have my money back up, back yeah. up, and be on the safe side. So the CBDCs in Europe discussion is uh, put forward by the European Central Bank, and uh, actually by the European Commission. We passed a, a white paper as of June 28th. And with uh, with the goal that this will be uh, this will be put into place by 2025, we will have European elections coming up, up next year. So you can imagine that there are plenty of people who just would like to stick to their old values and to good old cash and other uh, tangible uh, products in the monetary industry, and uh, that this will be a big issue in the in the election campaigns. Um, the Chinese and uh, Governor Ueda uh, is uh, looks at this from a very technical point of view. Uh, they have it ready to go, uh, but uh, they wait until they don't want to be the first, uh, the front runners. So I would rather say the Europeans are again the ones who will take the risk, and I hope. Uh, I will probably not be in office anymore. When, and <laughs> we we'll have about be. five minutes left, and the big story globally, economically, is the BRICS, the movement of de-dollarization, de-globalization. 41 countries lining up now to try to join this uh, economic and political movement. Pretty, you know, start with the BRICS. Yeah. Give us your overview, and I would like to get Dr. Coleman and Steve's take on that as well. All right. Uh, just before BRICS, uh, de-dollarization is this hot topic. If you read the headlines, it seems like there's a global rebellion against the U.S. dollar. So I just want to assure all of you, it's a bit of, uh, it's all fantasy because 90% of the global trade is done in U.S. dollars, 60% of global reserves are in the U.S. dollars, and 40% of the global debt is issued in the U.S. dollar. So if you think you're going to, de you know, change that overnight, uh, yeah, it's just not going to happen. Now, in a multipolar world, there obviously will be other alternatives that will come up, and, and that is organic, and that's natural. I, I don't, uh, countries have been, uh, you know, um, trading in each other's currencies forever, so there's nothing new in that. They will see a, a stark increase in that, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, coming to BRICS, so in August, next month, the BRICS, uh, the top five emerging um, markets in the world are going to be meeting, and this is where everybody uh, thinks that they will be launching the BRICS currency. Um, the problem with the BRICS currency is, other than the fact that these are great emerging markets, these countries have little to do with each other, and the, the trade deficit and the trade balance is not quite uh, equal. So, and of course, a couple of them are the biggest adversaries of each other. So good luck with that, with getting all five of them to, to use a currency, especially if China wants to lead that. I can bet you the other countries are going to run the other direction. So they have to be very pragmatic about it. Um, but uh, you know, some of the BRICS countries obviously will make use of the currency if, if they do launch it, and that's perfectly fine. Um, so you know, we have to move with the, the changing times. 
in the world. And I think the U.S., I, I, God, I hope we get the right leadership because the way that the rest of the world is moving, you need somebody who's economically sound and really knows which direction this country needs to head or else we are in deep shit. Well, <laughs> um, Somebody's got to say it. <laughs> well, I think everybody here loves it, but the question is just who is the worst often. <laughs> you mentioned before the number 25 in the index. Uh, so with regards to dollarization, and uh, I would still think that the dollar, and you mentioned the numbers, will be number one uh, also in the future. There are no alternatives right now. However, if we look at who is financing international infrastructure projects, and this is something where we de definitely need to have a look. Here we lost out to Asia, uh, especially to China, if you look at the Asian Investment Bank, how much money they have already put on the plate with regards to Africa, with regards to, other, uh, to the rest of, of Asia, down south, um, and even Europe already. So IMF and World Bank are losing out on that. I mean, they are just concentrating right now on minor things, looking at Ukraine, for example, and uh, how, to, how to restructure this and rebuild this country again. But... Uh, the big things are being financed already out of Asia. And this is where we create imbalances and where we from the West will definitely have to have a close look in order to keep our independence and economic freedom, and uh, especially the economic freedom, because those guys tick differently than we do. Steve, last word? Uh, the key thing is, in terms of a currency or anything else, if you have a trustworthy currency, i.e. it keeps a stable value, you will dominate the world. Look at the Dutch, 1500s, literally underwater, uh, broke away from the Habsburg Empire, became the capital center of the world, created a global empire. How did they do it? Key thing was a stable currency. The Brits took it up with the pound when they took the pound seriously. We took it up from, from the British, having a sound currency. So after uh, 2024, one of the issues that's going to come up, it will be a peripheral issue, will be the Federal Reserve, the central bank. And the key thing is, if you don't fight inflation, I think a couple of candidates are already on to this, you don't fight inflation by trashing an economy. You do it by stabilizing the dollar. So in closing, I'll make a prediction. It will be a few years before it will happen. You can forget it if I'm wrong. But in a few years, the U.S. is going to have a new version of the gold standard. All right, everybody, a big hand, round of applause for Preeti Upala, Dr. Barbara Colm, and Steve Forbes. Thank you all very much for your time today. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Project Veritas's success and health is vital to the future of the United States. We need a free press. We need people, whistleblowers, journalists who are enabled and protected when they tell the truth. Who can you trust in a post-truth world? And I do know that you all are about the truth. I know that I would not have found some of the TCO information had it not been for Aaron coming right. forward. Project Veritas protected me, but also my identity. You know, I, I could have been exposed right away, and I wasn't. I trust you guys. We spent a lot of time in prayer in my family. We thought about it. This was the answer that seemed to be the most it's the last bastion that I see of people doing journalism. If the goal is truth, let's take it. Let's bring it to people who will expose it. And I know that you guys will share it in a way that's appropriate. And if you want our country to turn back towards God and family and our Constitution, then prepare yourselves so that when you're called into action, you can be brave and you can do the right something. All right, who's ready to be brave? Yeah, that's what I like to hear. Are you guys uh, pretty well compressed toward the front of the stage? I've had a request from Hannah that, that we skinny up, but if, you, if you're good where you are, great. If you want to fill in some of the spots up here, uh, I think they would love it even more. Um, Project Veritas has been very important in culminating relationships with whistleblowers because were it not for some of the whistleblowers who have bravely come forward, uh, the lying liars would continue to lie to us because they think we're stupid. 
and we're not. You know who else is not stupid? Hannah Giles. She's very smart. She is the CEO of Project Veritas, and she was launched into the cultural stratosphere in 2009 with the uh, Acorn Pimps and Hoes investigation, which we all remember, and now she's at the helm of this organization that is finding whistleblowers and telling their stories so this is going to be a, a very interesting panel of some of uh, the most learned and bravest whistleblowers that exist today that have worked from within to come outside and tell you their crucial and critical stories. So let's welcome, to introduce everybody, Hannah Giles, the CEO of Project Veritas. It's for you, Freedom Fest. <laughs> Who's Can you hear me? Can you hear me? How are y'all? Okay, so. I'm the new CEO of Project Veritas. Um, I've been behind the scenes in this movement for over a decade. I brought James O'Keefe the ACORN video investigation of 2009, and I was wearing a whole lot less than I'm wearing today <laughs> for that video. Um, when I did that story, I was 20 years old. I'd been working on it since I was 19 years old. Brought it to James. We worked together, got an amazing product. Then we took it to Andrew Breitbart. Andrew Breitbart had been working closely with Pat Cadell, a pollster for Jimmy Car Carter. Back when he was like, so Pat Cadell was 21 when he was a pollster for Jimmy Carter, and then he polled the nation for decades after that. When James brought the video footage to Andrew, Andrew said, this is something that the American people need, and here's, here's why. And he talked about pa Pat Cadell's research. And it, Pat Cadell's research was the disenfranchised, the disenchanted majority of Americans. There's not a 50-50 divide. The majority of Americans are frustrated, and they're pissed off, and they're synced up. And that's why he took the ACORN video investigation. And Andrew said, I will protect you, and your peril will be my peril. And that's how Project Veritas launched. James O'Keefe has done an amazing job launching this, this company. And now there's 50 people over at Project Veritas, and one of our specialties is the federal whistleblowers and corporate insiders. So today I want you guys to get to know some of our federal whistleblowers and hear their stories and understand where we're going as a news organization. Take it from here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Aaron, uh, Aaron Stevenson. I was a, a former DHS employee, I got fired. Um, I blew the whistle on child sex trafficking back in 2021, and then I came forward publicly to blow the whistle on some pretty inherent uh, USCIS corruption about asylum as a whole. And then right before they fired me, I came out again about how many terrorists we brought in from Afghanistan during the fall of Kabul in 2021. I got fired, and here I am. <laughs> And then my name is Tara Rodas, and thanks to the bravery of Aaron Stevenson, and thanks to Project Veritas and James O'Keefe for publishing the story, I was sitting on the Pomona Fairplex emergency intake site processing unaccompanied children. So you may know that children were coming to this country from other countries. We were taking them into the care, HHS, and then delivering them to sponsors, sponsors, unvetted sponsors throughout the United States. So because one whistleblower came forward and because one organization was willing to tell the truth, I was able to then uncover and report that the U.S. government is the middleman in a large-scale, multi-billion dollar child trafficking operation. We literally have government-sponsored, taxpayer-funded child trafficking. So one whistleblower coming forward, telling the truth, sets in motion a cascade of things that you could never imagine. So I was very grateful for the opportunity for someone to tell the truth. And who knows, maybe one of you could be the next person to come forward.
Good morning, y'all. My name is Kyle Serafin. I'm a uh, recovering FBI agent. <laughs> uh, I spent six years at the FBI investigating counterintelligence. I worked on the Chinese threat, which is a legitimate and serious problem. Although, unfortunately, we have a non-legitimate and an unserious group of people that are dealing with it from the federal government. Uh, I always tell people that the federal government is probably the worst tool to solve any problem. It's sometimes the only tool, uh, but that is rare. It's more and more rare. Uh, I can see there's a defund the IRS shirt out there. I can get well behind that idea. Uh, a, a short tax code would be nice, maybe less tax. In fact, our founding fathers probably got involved physically over far less than what we have tolerated over the years. Um, and so one of the things that I would say is most important, and, and my whistleblowing activities are a number of them. Some of them are public, some of them are private, some of them with Project Veritas, some of them have gone to other news media organizations. Generally speaking, I went to Congress, which is the right way to do things. They teach you that they're going to allow you to go to Congress. You can bring your, your petition for grievance. This is what we're supposed to be able to do. There's U.S. law that says we can do so. 5 U.S.C. 7211 says all federal government employees can do this. Uh, the people on the stage have realized that that is not necessarily a good outcome. That's not the way that you're going to get a favorable outcome for the American people. And in many ways, we've gotten a government that has gotten far, far away from its original purpose. It doesn't serve the people anymore. Many of you will all know this. I'm preaching to the choir. But it's actually serving its own interests. And I, I've kind of been on this crusade to let people know two things. Number one, the FBI is an intelligence agency first. That's big and dangerous. When you have an intelligence agency that has the ability to go out and arrest people, that's what the secret police in every single totalitarian uh, situation in history has been. So we have to know that up front. It's an intelligence agency, which means you should have an inherent distrust. And the second thing is, is there's a thing called the administrative state. And many people call it the deep state. And I think that's far too sexy. If you've ever worked in government, you know way more about the fact that it is not sexy. It's actually, you know, not a parking garage in the dark where people are handing off dossiers and they're having covert meetings. It's actually like a crappy floor at like a Sheraton that's been stained for many years. And there's ceiling tiles that have holes in them because somebody hasn't repaired the mold. That's more government, right? And government in general is, like I said, it's the least efficient way to solve these problems. But when you consider that all the interests are aligned within the government, we're not looking at evil people. We're looking at an evil sort of culture that exists. And that's incredibly dangerous for all of us as citizens. We have to demand that thing back. So um, I've been kind of pushing that everybody sort of understand that they have to hold their own line. Not everybody is going to be in the position to say, this is a government overreach, and I'm going to step forward and expose it. Most people's job is actually going to be one of two things. One, supporting people that do come forward, whether it be financially, whether it be with your votes, whether it be voicing it to your representatives. That's a good way to do it. And the other way is that you personally do not accept tyranny in your own lives. And that's an incremental step. And the only way you do that is you draw your line in the sand. Some of us lost that line in 2020. People lost a lot of freedoms. We've got to regain that line, stand in front of it, and then do not let it fall no matter what happens to you. And that may mean we have to get comfortable with going to jail, with civil disobedience. And there are people, you have to believe, that are willing to give their life for it. I have friends who died in the military service when I was, uh, when I was enlisted. This thing happens. So if we're going to say that this is a, a land of the free, home of the brave, we have to act like that. And brave means there are going to be consequences that are uncomfortable for you, right? You may lose your job. You may lose friends. You may have family members that don't talk to you. I have all those things. I've done all those things, actually. Um, and when that happens, that's OK. That's what your job is. If you want to look forward and see the future, I've got young children, and I need to see that my children are going to live in America closer to what I grew up in. That's my, that's my, uh, my message to everybody. Thank, thank you, guys. So we're going to ask them some questions about what, what um, has happened since they came forward. But first, I want you to hear from Arden. She develops our insiders in both the corporate and government side. Go ahead, Arden. Hi, my name is Arden Young. I am an investigative journalist at Project Veritas, and our investigative team is the first point of contact a whistleblower has with the organization. So um, when I'm speaking with a potential whistleblower, I'm going over all the possible options they have, um, potential next steps. I'm verifying their identity. I'm verifying that the story and the claims they're making are true. I go through their credentials. And when I am relaying information from a whistleblower back to our team, I'm maintaining a layer of confidentiality. So I'm not even sharing unnecessary details about our whistleblower with our team. So for example, um, Kyle and I have been in contact for a very long time, um, I think over a year now. 
And it's just this past week that certain members of our team found out that he's my source. <laughs> After all the TV appearances and everything. So we take confidentiality really, really, really seriously here. Um, I tend to focus on government whistleblowers. I've spoken with dozens and dozens of sources within all sorts of government agencies. And um, here we have three who ultimately made the huge decision to share their stories on the record. And I deeply, deeply admire them. And it's just such an honor to have worked with them. Arden, could we talked last night, um, and you, you expressed how many more people we have inside, and they ultimately decide not to come forward. Can you share what that's like and why these three are so important for our nation right now? Um, on one hand, when someone makes the decision to not come forward, it's, it's heartbreaking, it's disappointing, and I can deeply sympathize with it because people have families to look after and these huge institutions are incredibly daunting to blow the whistle on. Um, these three put everything on the line. Um, they have families and ultimately they made that decision. But um, it, it's heartbreaking when someone decides not to, but I, I can't say that um, I can blame them you know, I, I've never been in that position, and these three are so much braver than I could ever be. So, Aaron, do you want to share um, some of the impact of coming forward and also what's been happening in your personal life since then? Yeah, so, of course. Um, so, of course, I got fired. So, obviously, moving-wise, I'm moving around a little bit. Um, I'm a single father, so I'm raising my two kids which is like my first you know, kind of job in life. Otherwise, I'm going to continue fighting child trafficking. And the only thing that's really changed as a whole is, because I, I have a personal take when it comes to the courageous part. I never felt that. I felt scared. I felt um, disgusted. And I felt desperate. And that's what kind of led me to the whole thing of like, I got to come forward and do something. Um, but now I feel really good, because I feel like I'm actually doing things that are good. Uh, the best thing about being fired is the government, the only thing that they said was, we don't trust you anymore. It wasn't, they didn't call me a liar, and they didn't call me wrong. So that, that felt good. So I'm, I'm okay where I'm at in life right now. <laughs> and how about you, Tara? Okay, well, it's been an interesting ride. So as a result of seeing Aaron's disclosure that members of transnational criminal organizations were sponsoring the kids, and I'm looking at these cases, and I find out that we actually had a sponsor who was MS-13 affiliated. And from the day I reported that case, it took them less than 30 days to take me off the case, accuse me of wrong action as a cover for their own action, which was to, in front of my peers, have me clean out my desk, walk me off my site with security, and take my badge. So I had been saying all along to people, you know, the day they walk me off the site, it's going to be because of child trafficking. I will not stop. I had made the decision. And like Kyle said, you have to put a line in the sand as to what you were going to accept. I could not accept that the United States government was luring migrant, vulnerable indigenous children to this country and putting them in modern day slavery. It is unacceptable, it is un-American, and we are better than that. Nobody should stand for that. So, the day they walked me off my site, took my badge, fortunately, because my agency had loaned me to Health and Human Services, my agency said, uh, right now, obviously we're concerned for your safety, we will get two agents, you know, gun-carrying agents to come escort you home. I mean, they were concerned for my safety. You know, I'm dealing with MS-13 and the government, right? So they didn't know what might happen. Fortunately, my husband escorted me home. But that's led to the ability to talk to law enforcement, talk to members of Homeland Security Investigations, talk to people who can actually go rescue the kids and prosecute criminals. I also had the privilege to speak uh, before the House Judiciary Committee 
and tell the truth that children today are being sold for sex, children today are in debt bondage, they are in labor trafficking situations because they owe money to the cartels, and this needs to stop. So along with my buddy Aaron, I'm going to continue to speak the truth until children are rescued, criminals are prosecuted, and the United States government no longer is putting billions of dollars to traffic children. So I spent six years working for the FBI, another year that they claim I was working for them, but they didn't pay me, so that felt really weird. Uh, it's one of those jobs that uh, they take your badge, your gun, kick you out of your, your space, don't let you come in the office, and then they claim that you're an employee. I don't know if any of you have ever had a job like that. Um, but it's not very good. It doesn't pay very well. So um, so I was doing this, this gig for the Bureau. I was out in, in Las Cruces, New Mexico, of all places. I actually went out there thinking I was getting away from politics because I spent five years working in D.C., which is as bad as I could imagine it being. And then I go out. I'm in the middle of the desert. I'm like, this is great. I'm just going to run after uh, you know, Indian crimes. That was what I was doing. I was on an Indian reservation. Literally the least important thing for the Bureau, the best suited for my skill set. I was enjoying it. And two things happened almost simultaneously. I got an email five days after the Attorney General said that he was not going to be prosecuting parents at school board meetings for voicing their opinions about how their children are educated. That seemed reasonable. He said he wouldn't use counterterrorism resources. Five days later, I get an email from the Assistant Director of the FBI, a guy named Carlton Peoples, because we always name drop here. And Carlton Peoples sent out a thing. He was the Assistant Director saying that we were going to create a threat tag to investigate parents. So that was my first disclosure, going to Congress. I set that up. It ended up in Jim Jordan's hands. Many of you are familiar with that sort of situation, that overreach. And at the same time, I also was told by our president that I had to go get a vaccine shot that I didn't want to get because I'm a religious person, I'm a Catholic, and I said, no, no, thank you to that. Those things happen almost simultaneously. I think there's a plan. I think it's God's plan. I don't know what it is. I'm just kind of on the ride right now. And so what I always tell people is that it's not an easy path, but it is simple when you set your principles up the way that they need to be. And since then, uh, my family and I sold our house. We lost our home, which was brilliant. Uh, it was a beautiful place on two acres in the desert. And I had mountain views and my kids were running around. It was very idyllic. And we moved into my folks' place at 41 years old. And now, my, now we've moved out. We had six months where we were living in basically two of the three bedrooms that my parents bought. That's a rough thing to do when you're, when you're grown up and you think that you're running your own life and you've been on your own two feet. So the end result was not great in the interim. But at this point, my wife and I looked at each other and said, what are we going to do? We're going to outbreed them. So we have another baby on the way who's going to be born soon. So that's a fun thing to do. If you want to win this fight, you've got to have skin in the game. So i got a baby due in about four weeks. Um, and and that's, the, that's the whole thing. It's got to be about hope. It's got to be about action. It's got to be about continuing to live your life the way that you want, modeling the values that you want. Uh, my favorite amendment is, is the 10th Amendment. I think we need a, a 10th Amendment revolution in this country where we take things back towards the states. And so what is the action plan that you can do that? There's really a simple action. You have to act locally. You need to go to your county sheriffs. You need to get them to divest from federal government. You need to get out of federal task forces. You need to have people step in to their local city councils and act these local ways. Take small steps because many of you can do those things. They're within your power. Everybody's looking for the action plan. That's the action plan. Look around you very, very close by and you can do it. You won't lose your house for it, most likely. <laughs> so, you know, we all are familiar with the quote and the sentiment of all that's necessary for evil to triumph is that good men do nothing. At Project Veritas, we are brave and we do something, and we have developed dozens and dozens of insiders in both the federal government and major corporations that control special interests in this nation. Um, Kyle and I were, and so anyway, so the, the news media is going to, hold them accountable, right? We're supposed to hold them accountable. We have a government that was designed with an executive branch, legislative branch, and a ju judicial branch, and they ha all have checks and balances. But now we have this other fourth branch of government in, with our intel community, and it's just growing and growing, and there's no checks and balances. And so that's what we are hoping to do with our investigative journalism, and it's what the, the media is for, but they just have not been doing their jobs and you look at all the major news outlets and they don't even have real investigative units. It's too risky, it takes too long, and it's expensive. So at Project Veritas, what do we do? We take on the highest risk <laughs> and, we, and we work really hard and, and I think the nation is gonna be better for it. We have countries all over the world calling us and saying, can you guys help us develop a Project Veritas in our country? We need this, we're, we're hungry for this. Um, I would like to 
talk to all of you afterwards and we'll all be available to talk. But I do want Kyle to finish out with something. We talked about Police Battalion 101. Mm -hmm. Can you finish us out with that story? Yeah, folks, if you're not familiar with the story of police, Reserve Police Battalion 101, I think it's a really poignant reminder in history of the way that regular people get involved in doing essentially genocide and atrocities. Um, and you can find all kinds of information about this at the American Holocaust Museum. They do a great job sort of portraying it. But the, the quick and dirty is this. There were a bunch of people that were butchers and bakers and candlestick makers, and they all had a job as reserve police officers in the Weimar Republic. They were able to move forward in a very short period of time, a couple of years, being asked to do simple things. They never started with death camps. That's not how atrocities start. They start with, go get a list of names. Find me all the unvaccinated, please. Make them all stand in this line and get tested every couple days. And these sort of things can move directly to a line where we see people getting shoved into boxcars and regular people who, like I said, are everyday citizens executing the elderly, shooting toddlers because they are too slow getting into those boxes. And so that is a very important reminder that many of us think that will be Oster Schindler, but most people actually participated in what happened in Nazi Germany. We have to be aware of that first. That's why I think that line in the sand is so, so important. And that's the best reminder that we have in history right now. Thank y'all all so much. Appreciate it, y'all. Please all. come find us and we'll chat. Good to go. Crush it. Project Veritas and the Whistleblowers. They'll be performing on the main stage a little later with the full band. Um, so, as you know, the environmental movement, the progressive movement, is really just a way for agencies and those seeking power to obtain power and control and tax money. And uh, they don't give a damn if they cripple the environment. And there are very few people who would be considered a hero of the environment by Time Magazine who are actually telling the truth. And one of them happens to be a best-selling author. You might have heard of two of his books, San Francisco and Apocalypse Never. Uh, he has an organization. He's the founder and president of environmental progress, real environmental progress, the truth. Nuclear. I love it so much it hurts my feelings, so let's hear it for author and legend Michael Schellenberger. Good morning, everybody. Come on, guys. You guys ready to talk about energy? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Welcome, welcome. Well, let's get into it, guys. We're just going to start the conversation. We only have 25 minutes, and we've got a big topic. A year ago, we were all worried that we were not going to have enough natural gas in particular to support our allies in Europe. Here we are a year later, abundant oil and gas. It appears that the oil and gas industry has responded in a big way, or is it just that Europe had a warm winter? They didn't need to use as much oil and gas. Who wants to start off? Is, are we dealing with just... The, the amazing response from American oil and gas producers, or are we dealing with soft demand? What's going on? Who wants to take it? Yeah? I'll take it, sure, yeah. yeah. And um, introduce yourself before you start. Uh, I'm Eric Rice, uh, Chief Growth Officer with King Operating in Dallas. Um, I think if you look at what's happening right now, it's definitely been a response. I think every, every one of us in this panel here are working 15, 18, 20-hour days, working on vacation. You know, we had a Zoom, people are on vacation still working because we see the importance you know, right now, the supply issue, when you eliminate pipelines, you eliminate tracking, right? So the getting rid of the pipelines right off the bat, we're trucking a lot of stuff, a lot of people are. But we also have very disparate opinions on what's happening with information, kind of like similar to our jobs report, where you can look at the jobs report and there's a one in 16,000 chance they beat their estimates. It's pretty much the same with supply and demand. But American producers are stepping up right now, and they need to as we enter into a technological phase that none of us have ever seen before. You know, when you get into AI, AI and all the information war that we find ourselves in, that is predicated on energy. So without American producers stepping up, we'd be in a much, much different position. And John, do you think that, did we, did we panic last year? You know, oil and gas prices, you know, the stock prices went way up. It felt like Europe really need, I wrote a ton of columns about the need to step up oil and gas production. Did we overreact or was that an appropriate response? And where are we now? Uh, John Engel with Gulf Coast Western. Um, 
No, I don't think there was an overreaction. I think it was more of a, uh, a balanced approach that the industry took because you had COVID that came out of nowhere. And, you know, if you looked at what the rig count was before COVID and then pretty much all drilling stopped because you had all this oil flowing to uh, your, uh, your processing plants, but no one buying the gasoline that was or the other products because COVID shut the economy down. So when the economy picked back up, all of the operators and everyone in the industry is like, okay, we're not going to go out just because oil prices bounced up. We're not going to go out and just drill, drill, drill. We're going to go and just have a measured approach so that we can bring on the demand as it's needed, but we're not going to put ourselves in that same position where you have the bottom taken out from under you and you have to react that way because it was, it was very bad for the industry, but in the same light, it made the industry much more efficient because all those cutbacks, the, the companies got very, you know, much more streamlined and more efficient with their costs in, in drilling and bringing the uh, product to market. So, Dan, we, so in President Biden's State of the Union, he said that, you know, we may need to use oil for another 10 years or so. <laughs> um, that was a, but I don't think he meant it as a laugh line, but he got a bunch of laughs for it. Yeah, but even this conference is, I mean, this panel is called The Future of Energy is 2030, the end of petroleum. So are we going to run out of petroleum by 2030? Are we going to stop using it? That's only seven years away, if my math is correct. So <laughs> well, where are we, I mean, what is this, I mean, yeah, are we running out of oil? Are we going to stop using it? That's a great question. And, and ironically enough, I actually get asked that more often than you'd think. First of all, my name is Dan Sauer. I have a company, um, president and CEO of Vertical Petroleum Industries. I uh, live just about an hour and a half north of Dallas, Texas, up in Oklahoma. Um, to answer the question, I, I, uh, I'll start with this. First of all, when Biden got elected, being in the oil industry, you couldn't help but wonder what, what's going to happen. Uh, you know, we were pretty oil friendly throughout the last administration. I'm a big fan of Donald Trump and, and what he did for the industry. Biden got elected and he literally raged war, as you can all remember. The first thing he did is he shut down the pipeline. He decides to no, no drilling on federal land, which is going to have a huge impact. I never realized that what he was going to do for my individual company was going to turn my company from about a two, three million dollar company to about a 30 million dollar company. The reason why is because of what that did to the oil prices. And that's not necessarily good. It's the perception of what has happened is probably more important. I, I take a little different approach than most of the gentlemen on, on the stage here. Most of these guys know a tremendous more about the production of oil and oil or the future of oil, probably more than I. I started the company because I was an investor in oil and gas. And I had invested in projects with companies like these gentlemen right here, and I had done okay. And, and I had the opportunity to, to purchase a lease. Didn't even know what that meant at the time. And I bought one and it did very well. And then I brought some partners in. We did another one, another one. All of a sudden, next thing you know, I've, I'm up to my eyeballs in the oil and gas business. I'm not from that background. I'm not a petroleum engineer or a you know, geologist, but I surround myself with some guys and we've been able to do extremely well. Um, to answer the final, finally to answer that question, I will say, um, oil's not going anywhere. I can tell you right now, it's not about green energy. It's not about the left saying, you know, we're going to rage war. It's literally not going anywhere because it's in our everyday life. It's in thousands of products that we use every day. We need oil. And so, to answer your question, oil's not going anywhere, so, but regardless RJ, of the perception. Well, sure, but if you, if you read the New York Times, you read the Washington Post, you listen to the automakers, RJ, they are saying, look, we're all going electric. They're converting their assembly lines. Um, isn't it just a matter of time before we make the switch from petroleum to lithium? Hello, uh, my name's RJ Burr with Panex. Um, you know, really, we all, we're, right now, we're all looking at one trigger and one thing and when it was a convergence of things happening over the last handful of years that came to right now. I mean, we kind of, we call it a, a, the converging of the six factors. And you have one is the product, oil. 6,000 products made from one barrel. It's ingrained in everybody's life. The, the modern world began the day we drilled the first commercial oil well. And we started utilizing, utilizing the products from oil. Now, when you take our product and you realize we're so dependent on it, then you go, okay, was there anything to replace oil with? Is there an alternative energy? Is there something that if we wanted to remove oil from our lives, is there something that can feasibly do it? And the answer is no. 
And so you go, okay, well, there's nothing to replace oil with. Well, what about supply and demand? Well, right now we're running about 10, 15 million barrels a day short on what we consume for, versus what we produce. You say, okay, well, how's that looking in the future? Well, by 2030, they expect that to be 30 million barrels a day. Okay, well, if we're running at a deficit, well, are we putting enough money in to find more oil? Well, in 2014, we were investing right at a trillion dollars worldwide in upstream development. Now, we're going to be lucky to get 300 billion this year. So we've dropped 70% in our, our exploration funds and what we're doing. So we have a product that is, heck, it's, you hate to say it, but the world's addicted to it. So you have a product the world's addicted to. There's nothing to replace it with. We're using more than we, than we produce and we're not investing enough to find more of it. Well, I'm not a rocket scientist, but when you line all of those together, now you add the last piece of the puzzle, which made it, you hate to say beneficial for us, but look, everybody's in the oil business. Whether you wanna be or not, you're in the oil business. Hmm. And so if you're gonna pay the prices at the pump every day, don't you think it would benefit you to find a way to make money in oil and get the flow of the money coming the other way? That way, at least you hedge it. And so when all this started happening, personally, I was a little conflicted about it. I was like, okay, hang on. I'm making a killing. My partners are making a killing. Do I feel right about that when everybody else is hurting so much? And then I started thinking about it. I said, well, you know what? Yeah, I do. Because if I can make my partner's money in this environment when everybody else is hammering them, then line it up six days a week and twice on Sunday, I'm going to make my partners as much money as I can. Because now you add the last piece of the puzzle and that's the true American oil industry. When COVID hit and prices crashed and you ask the average American, hey, how did that affect the oil industry? 99% of the people would have said, oh, it's Exxon. Oh, it's Shell. Oh, it's one of the majors. They can handle it. Yeah, they could handle it, but they're not the ones that were hit. Yeah. The ones that were hit were your roughly 9,000 independent American oil producers that average 12 employees or less that produce 83% of our oil 90% of our gas and drill more than 90% of our wells. Those were the companies that were hit. And so when all of that came together, it was April 20, 2020. That was the day the prices crashed. That was the minute that the opportunity opened up because it, up until that point, there was not a chance to acquire reserves like this in the last 70 years. Well, let's get to that a little bit. I mean, um, Eric, do you want to give us a sense of what, what is going on in the oil and gas industry in terms of market structure and where is it headed, what needs to happen, what are the opportunities for investors? Sure. Well, a couple of things. So RJ just touched on some great points there. You know, we use more than we have. Uh, you know, the, the economics don't make sense. We're investing less. We need more. Uh, that's Bidenomics, right? He just described yeah. Bidenomics in a, in a nutshell. Um, where the industry is heading right now is understanding that there's a bridge. So when you really look at the future of energy and where we're going, it's kind of unavoidable that you have to talk about fission eventually. Like we're using it on nuclear submarines and all these other things. So the oil industry right now is completely correct, is that the independent people are getting slaughtered. The smaller companies, we just went through a very rough patch with higher costs, lower, lower prices, and that put a lot of people out of business. It, it would almost appear, uh, if, if we were being honest, it would almost appear as though our own government's trying to destroy our energy sector. Um, just throwing that out there. Just throwing that out there. And for us to be able to fight back, it's why I'm in this industry. I come from technology. I was actually have a quantum background. So getting into petroleum, the reason I got in here is because the way that we structure things in the marketplace is that investors get to avoid the IRS, which everyone loves. We get to drill domestic energy and create freedom. No one's going to give it to us. So I think that the entire energy sector, of course, we're focused on profits because that's, that's the role of a company in, in an economic system. But I think that we're all really focused on energy independence. I mean, that's, that, that's what made this country great three and a half years ago, and it's exactly what will make this country great again. With John, yeah. John, it seems like, I mean, I'm, I'm try, help us understand this, because on the one hand, it seems like the Biden administration is waging war on the oil and gas sector. They're trying to overregulate it. They'd rather bring in oil from abroad than increase production at home. At the same time, you guys all seem pretty bullish on your sector. So how do we square these two things? Is, it, is there a war on oil and gas, or is this a, a great time to be an investor in oil and gas? Uh, well, there certainly is. I mean, like... Uh Dan was saying, you know, if you look at a graph of when of, of oil prices, look at the day Biden was elected, and it just goes straight up from there. When Obama was in office for eight years, the average price was $88. So from a selfish standpoint, you know, we knew we were looking at 
more than likely higher oil prices because, and just like the other gentleman said, you had, you know, war on pipelines immediately, war on leases, you know, to not, not allow us to drill where we know the oil is on these, these uh, national uh, oil leases or federal oil leases. And then they open up the floodgates, you know, let's go to Venezuela, let's go to Saudi Arabia, let's go to all these countries that hate us, that produce oil in a much less clean manner than we do here. We have 44 billion barrels of oil that of known proven reserves, and that changes on a daily basis, but that's the latest figures that I came across with another 198 billion reserve, uh, in, in oil uh, in undiscovered reserves that the geologists and engineers think is, has not been tapped yet or found yet. We have plenty of our own oil. I do not understand why Biden is reaching out to these other countries to put oil that is produced in a horrible manner, to put it on tankers. There's almost 9,000 oil tankers traversing the globe at any given time. They burn 2,600 gallons of fuel oil an hour. You do that kind of math. Is that cleaner than producing it right here on our own soil? So yeah, I don't, there is a war on our own product, but I do not understand why they are going, if they're so environmentally friendly that we're gonna shoot our own selves in our own feet, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever because we have it here and we produce it cleaner and it doesn't pollute. What we're doing is it's, it's the same scenario as with all the green initiatives. We have to follow the rules. We're the parents that are paying the, the air conditioning bill and we're trying to keep our house cool. Meanwhile, the bratty kids on the other side of the planet have no rules and they leave the windows open and they're letting all the heat from the summer in. Well, I, I'll, I'll interject one point right there. I had, a, I had a partner of mine send me a picture the other day. And he said, hang on, which one's destroying the environment? And in one half of the picture, big, beautiful, pristine hillside, trees. I'm not going to lie, it was a big, beautiful picture. And there was a little bitty pump jack on top of one of the hills. You know, a little horse that goes up and down that pumps the oil. The other half of the picture was a lithium strip mine. Mm. And he said, hang on, which one is destroying the environment? And, and so when you look at the argument, it's disingenuous. If somebody's making an argument and it doesn't make sense, then they're being disingenuous. If one plus one does not equal two, it's wrong. Yeah. It will always equal two. It'll never be 1.9, never be 2.1. And so clean energy. Well, if we wanted to go clean, we'd go nuclear, uh, natural Tomorrow. gas. I mean, that's, we already have the, so, so when you look at it, and I tell my kids, look, whenever you're in a debate with somebody, the minute they say, I feel, you won. Because yeah. facts don't care about feelings. It yeah. is what it is. Thanks, RJ. And Dan, I mean, wh wh why is it that you're so optimistic about this industry that so many people hate, that the president is waging war on, that people think it's a, a dinosaur industry? Wh wh what gives you, why are you so, why are you feeling so bullish about oil and gas, if that's the Well, case? I guess, again, to, to agree with everything that's been set up here today, I, um, I'll have to go back to an investment side of it. Um, from an investment side, fortunately, we still live in a free country. And the regulations are were hardest placed on federal land. Um, most of us are private uh, private land users. Um, the majority of, of the type companies that we deal with are, and, and we're still able to drill. And um, I'm optimistic because of the fact that I think we deal in all of our lives in a daily basis with misinformation. Never true words were said when we start talking about oil. First of all, we need oil and it's not just for energy it's not just for fuel and and you know it's so we need oil so if whenever you're dealing with a, a an industry that isn't going anywhere regardless of what you may or may not hear oil is not going anywhere i don't care if they can build all the electric cars they want i had the opportunity to drive an electric car and i'm a big fan of it actually um i it was a loner and it was incredible I still don't think it has any effect on what we're going to do because oil is needed in so many areas of our lives. So from an investment standpoint, I'm extremely optimistic. I used to say that it's a good year to be in oil. I've changed that tagline now to it's a good decade to be in oil. Um, if, if you look at, you know, all the economics, uh, but, you know, Goldman Sachs talks about where the, where the price of oil is going to be, and, and I'll leave that up to the economists. But, but I will say that it's stable, it's solid, and it's, it's, a great t it's a great decade to be in oil. So, Eric, what, what needs to happen? I mean, is the situ I mean, do you need any public policy changes? I mean, is the market where you need it to be, or, or is, is it a, does it matter who's in the White House or not? 
I, mean, I think we heard, obviously, there's a way in which I was wondering this last year is why are Republicans against, um, or, you know, why are, you know, why is the oil industry against Biden if he got oil prices to go up as high as they did? Um, you guys made a lot of money under Biden. The majors made a lot of money under Biden. Um, how important is public policy and, and what, if anything, needs to change in your view? It's a great question. Uh, public policy by itself, the, the constantly waiting for the government to do things to be supportive to you, those times need to be over. I think public perception is what needs to change. I mean, what we're living through right now is probably the longest confidence scam in the history of the world. You know, if you look at Scotland, they just put out a report where 80% of the windmills, they did a big TV special about how wind farms are saving the world. 80% of those windmills were being turned by diesel generators. It's a con. Um, you know, we... <laughs> We, we, we are looking at things like on one of our ranches where we're drilling, they, you know, the guy leased out some for a wind farm. I, I have a picture that I took, and I go, one of these things works and one of it doesn't. I sat there for six hours on a well, and I watched zero windmills turn. So public policy is one thing. Public perception and the ability for the people to come back and say, I don't want what you're selling to me. And they're selling it hard, right? We, you talked about oil. We, we're not supposed to have oil, right? Wasn't oil supposed to run out in the 70s? And then in the 80s, we were supposed to lose the beaches. We still have beaches. We still have oil. I think it's time for people to start looking into things themselves and seeing what, what's really happening. You know, to build an electric engine or a battery for an electric car, you need six to 800 barrels of oil. You need cobalt. You need lithium. All of those are mined with diesel energy. They're also done by you know, the average age of a cobalt miner in Africa is 11 and a half years old. So there's a lot of things that are just public perception. Once perception changes, policy follows suit. And I think that's the pathway America needs to head down. And John, do you think that we, does, do you need new policies? Do you even care about it? I mean, what is it, does it even matter who's in the White House? I, I mean, it really, yes, it certainly matters who's in the White House. But I don't think it, um, it affects us as long as, why does it matter, in other words, like you guys sort of, I mean, other than having somebody in the White House. Just, this just policy, and, and I think, it, you know, the disinformation part of it, I mean, it is, if you look at every, if you want to go back to the Stone Age, which is what I figure that the Greenies want us to do anyway, and if you don't want to eat, uh, because you have no idea how much fertilizer is made from oil and gas. If you look at a barrel of oil, 45% of it goes to making gasoline. The rest of it goes into everything else that you are wearing, that you, the medications you use, the food you eat. Again, 6,000 products. There is no other resource on the planet that has that many products made from it. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want oil and gas, you might as well go live in a cave and start wearing, making your own shoes from the animals that you kill and building your own tools out of, out of you know, wood and antler and just go back to that because that is where we would be without oil and gas. You, couldn't, you can't process steel. You can't get your green cars to market. You can't build a green car without it. You can't make a solar panel without oil and gas. But so then um, Dan and RJ, why, why, is, why is there such a big disconnect between the way, what I read in the New York Times and the Washington Post and the reality and the data showing increased oil and gas consumption. Why, why do people think it's an I, industry that's on decline if, in fact, it's so essential to my I love movies. I love movies and I love movie quotes. And one of my favorite movies is, usual, is The Usual Suspects. When he said the greatest trick the devil, the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Well, I would like to take that quote and modify it a little bit for today. The greatest trick the environmentalist movement ever pulled was convincing the world that oil was bad. That's, that's what has happened, is all of a sudden, it is hard to argue against somebody who's trying to save the world. Let's go wind, let's go green, let's go solar. I'm trying to save the world. Well, how, is it, how are you going to argue against Santa Claus? You, you, you can't. So you sit back and you let Santa Claus run that car into the wall, and eventually people are going to say, hey, that car is hitting a wall every time. Maybe let's go through this door over here. Santa's drunk. Exactly. And, and so when, when you look at it, I, I, was, I was at CPAC earlier this year, and a, a PBS reporter came up and asked me a question. He said, oh, you're the oil guy. I said, yeah, I'm the oil guy. He said, well, who do you want to win? I said, really, it depends on what me you ask. He said, huh? I said, if you ask the American me, the guy that has to live here like everybody else, I know I want the grown-ups to come back. I can live at $60 oil. I, I've, I've built my world around $20 oil. And, and so if, if oil's at 60, I'm fine. I said, however, if you ask the oil guy in me, I want the chaos to continue. Keep telling people to stay away from oil. Keep pumping money into green energy. Keep doing all that, because you know what you're going to do while you're doing that? I'm going to keep buying it. 
And when your illusion busts, and all of a sudden you realize that windmill is not going to power your house, what are you going to do? You're going to come back to oil. Well, those who have the oil at that point are going to be in a, sit in a, in a pretty strong position, aren't they? That's what we're aiming for. And, and Dan, do you worry about the public perception all, or should you just sort of keep, you know, well, keep on going on, or do you feel well, like think, there needs to be some better public engagement by the oil and gas industry? Well, I, to make I think you case? said it right there. I think that is, it is perception. I think everybody, I don't care if you're on the right or the left side of the aisle, I think everybody from an economic standpoint to a, just a need standpoint, everybody agrees that oil is a good thing. It's not until you politicize it. Um, until, and, and then all of a sudden, that perception starts turning political. All of a sudden, well, everybody over here says it's bad, so it must be bad. And everybody over here says it's so, – so it, it's literally perception. It's, this, it's the same reason I've got the, the outlook that I do on it, because of the fact that if everybody realized how many um, Nancy Pelosi's there are in the world that is up to their eyeballs invested in oil of while they're preaching that it's bad. Because it, it, I've seen it many, many times. Well, let's, um, let's you know, we're, we're going to have to wrap up, but let's do one. Let's do one last round. What's the most important thing for people who love freedom to know about the future of oil and gas in the United States? Let's start with you and Gold Down. Just do ten seconds. AI, digital currencies will create tyranny. The only way to fight that battle is to have enough energy stockpiled to fight the ammunition. That is the future of the world that we live in is AI and the function of AI, along with all the other functionality that we have today. Without energy that's stable and consistent, we're going to lose that battle. Yeah, quickly. I, I think that it's it's ironic that the same government that's trying to deregulate and try to talk bad about oil has also given some amazing tax benefits for us to go explore for it. So I will say oil's here to stay. It's a great investment, and that's why I've done that. John? Oil is America. We run on it. It is. It powers our economy, and we have one of the most powerful economies on the globe. And oil is the main reason behind it. So uh, let's keep it going strong. Let's produce it here, and uh, let's all benefit from it. RJ, final word. Final word. The standard of living historically is measured by the amount of energy you consume. Americans consume 2.6 gallons of oil per day. Third world countries, 0.37. Join Want to stay first world, eat consume. Thanks, RJ. Yes. Join me in thanking these guys. Well done, gentlemen. I want to go out and drive. Okay, beautiful. Who loves the abundance of natural resources we have in this country? Let's hear it. Oh, my Bentley runs on unicorn farts. Um, I don't have a Bentley. Okay. Uh, thank you so much to, for all of you showing up uh, early and eagerly and being attentive and warm and receptive to all of our speakers so far. And, of course, we appreciate our sponsors here that make Freedom Fest possible. And I want you to visit each and every one of them while you are here and make the most of your time. You will thank me later. Um, and we want to, especially today after that, thank our energy exhibitors, including Gulf Coast Western, King Operating, Panex, and Vertical Petroleum. They have booths in the exhibit hall, which uh, you will absolutely adore. And, of course, we have some updates with booth changes. That happens when you have a conference in motion. Go to our exhibit hall. They might differ from the printed program and signage. And uh, we have shared those changes with you in the daily email. So go ahead and check that. Check your spam folder if you haven't seen it. Braver Angels has moved to booth 300E, American Gold Exchange. I love gold. That's at 500M. C-SPAN is at booth 600R. Valorum has moved to 400E. V Vivek 2024 has moved to booth 201D, like dog. Uh, uh, so please enjoy the coffee break. Go get caffeinated. Uh, that's going to be in the exhibit hall. And we've got some incredible authors, as per usual, hosting their book signings. So if you need a few good summer reads... You can go in there at our bookstore, sponsored by Atlas Elite Publishing, also located in the exhibit hall. There's so much there for you. And right after the coffee break, 1030 sharp, you can watch The Infraction. It is an outstanding short narrative about Terrence Lewis, who was wrongfully convicted. So justice abounds, uh, as do treats, books, and beverages in the exhibit hall. Go enjoy. I'll see you back here at 1030. Thank you, lovelies. Yes.
bed and I stumble to the kitchen Pour myself a cup of ambition And yawn and stretch and try to come to life Jump in the shower and the blood starts pumping Out on the streets the traffic starts stopping With folks like me on the job from nine to five Working nine to five
every aspect of our life is under siege. We have to come into balance, but that all depends on us. that I come from a different planet from you primates, but all evolved sentient species recognize the principle of sentient respect, or what you would call human respect. Yesterday, we were minority, and all of a sudden today, we become oppressors. You don't fix discrimination with more discrimination.
everyone come 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 the break is done I hope you're all nourished in the exhibit hall the bosom of Freedom Fest she continues to lactate for three more days speaking of taxation is theft the government wants to take everything you have with no rhyme or reason I'm not a fan and they've got a, a, an army of 87,000 IRS agents who are going to do whatever they can to uh, exhume your still living body. We're not going to let that happen because right now we're going to uh, enter into an era of st tax strategies to preserve your wealth. You worked hard for it, so you should be able to keep it. Uh, leading the panel right now is Heather Wagonhalls. She is a best selling author, she is a personal finance authority. She has been in media and finance for over 25 years, and her expertise is perfectly crafted for this stage, this panel, and this glorious audience. So let's welcome Heather Wegenhals. Mm. Let me tell you how it will be. Good morning, everyone. I am thrilled to be here, and if you haven't seen me out at Freedom Fest TV in the corner, please join me. We're doing live streaming in the afternoon, but we're doing interviews all day. So if you want to catch the speakers in person, come down and learn all of the good stuff uh, from behind the scenes. But today, it's taxes, and ironically, taxes aren't really a laughing matter, but two of our three panelists our funny men, one of them so named America's Funniest Tax Guy by CNN. So we're going to take a little trip because in my 3-5 money method, what we talk about on my show, the fifth area of concern is our asset preservation. So this is tax mitigation strategies and estate planning. And to help me do that, I have these wonderful gentlemen the first one, Daniel Bunn, is the CEO of the Tax Foundation, and he is going to take us on a trip around the United States, and we're going to talk about tax. My next guest is going to be president of Americans for Tax Reform, and Grover Norquist is going to help us find our voice 
and find our exits. And finally, Ed Lyon of Excel Empire. He is uh, the one I told you about, America's Funniest Tax Man. And if these guys can't figure it out, well, Ed's going to help us beat the IRS legally with his tax strategies. So, gentlemen, welcome to the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, Daniel, take us on a trip. Well, thanks so much, Heather, and thanks for all of you for being here. I'm Daniel Bunn, President and CEO of Tax Foundation, and one of the things that we do is we engage at the state level with policy change. And, you know, summertime is a great time for road trips. And if you take a road trip across the country, you're going to not only be able to see the sites, maybe visit some national parks, friend, family and friends, but you're going to see the diversity of tax policy. Now, if you take one of the historic routes, like maybe the Lincoln Highway, you're going to cross through 15 different states. And of those 15 different states, 10 of them, let's say you're working a little bit on your road trip, 10 of those states will tax you on the first day that you work in those states. Now, Route 66 is a little bit better. You're only going to go through eight states. But three of those states are going to tax you on the first day that you work there. Now, we have 43 states in the union and 24 of them tax you on that first day that you work there. And this is a panel that's about preserving your wealth, but you have to earn your income first, right? So I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about personal income taxes and business taxes. Now, some states themselves have been going on an interesting road trip. They've been going to a destination that not many states have pursued uh, recently. Uh, between 1911 and 2021, only four states that had progressive graduated income tax rates moved to a flat tax structure. Since 2021, we've seen five states take that journey. And actually, there may be four or five more in the next year or so, depending on legislative momentum. And that's really an exciting thing to see because this is broader, base lower rate, more competitive, attractive tax policy. And in fact, 22 states since 2021 have reduced their personal income tax rates. So if your road trip takes you through New England, the Mid-Atlantic, the Southeast, the Southwest, the Mountain West, you're going to travel through a state that has better taxes than it did earlier. Now, you might notice that I didn't mention the West Coast. The West Coast, huh, those states are taking a little bit different path to a different destination. And in fact, yes, just a little bit different. Yes, they're going to a place that some states have never gone before. In fact, you have Hawaii, California, and Washington State all pursuing wealth taxes. This is something that a state has never done before. And in fact, it's a high burden. In addition, California has a 14.4% top rate on personal income tax. And that's in addition to the top rate of 37% at the federal level. You have New York State and Maryland pursuing digital taxes, things that states have never done before. And it's moving in a very different direction than other states have been. And in fact, you know, road trips, most of the time you leave from your home, you go see some interesting things, and then you go back. But what we've seen recently is a dramatic increase in one-way road trips people who are recognizing the high tax burdens in their states and moving to more competitive, more attractive jurisdictions. And, you know, like at the beginning, I mentioned there are 43 states that tax personal income. That means there's seven states that don't. And in those states, Alaska, Nevada, Wyoming, South Dakota, Texas, Florida, and Tennessee, you don't have to worry about paying personal income tax. And on the business tax side, there are plenty of states that don't tax a business income. And we've seen 13 that have reduced their rates, including Pennsylvania, that's moved from 9.99% down to 4.99%. And uh, Indiana, that's moved from double-digit corporate tax to single-digit corporate tax. So as these states are moving, pay attention to your map and what road trip you might want to plan as well. And with that, I'll pass things over to Grover. Thank you. Uh, voice, when they try and raise taxes or offer to cut taxes in your state, join in. Get engaged. It's, it's, you'll be su pleasantly surprised how much you can actually move the needle getting the structures that you work with, the organizations you work with, to, to speak up when somebody wants to raise taxes or cut them, both at the local and the state level. But while you use your voice, there comes a point, 
I myself, before I emigrated to the United States, used to live in Massachusetts. Um, and at some point you just decide they're not listening, it's time to move. Uh, and moving is a very important strategy. Uh, I would suggest a couple of things. One is, don't just ask yourself, what is the tax structure, what, what are taxes now in that state? Take a look at what direction they're going. A low tax state that is raising taxes is much worse than a higher tax state that's bringing them down because you presumably want to live for a while in that state and today's taxes are interesting. The ones two years and three years and five years from now are also very interesting. And there's the good news. Um, easiest, when you have a progressive income tax, it's difficult, graduated income tax, it's difficult to cut that tax because in, uh, whereas they were doing this recently in North Dakota, there were seven rates. Seven rates, all of them below 3%, but seven different rates. Well, when you move them all down, everyone looks around and they, somebody's getting a bigger tax cut than me because there's so many. But when you have a single rate tax and 12 states in the country have one rate by constant, two rates, zero and then the rate that they have, but one a rate on taxable income, it's very difficult to raise that. Illinois, their flat rate is less than 5%. Illinois is, run, uh, Illinois is run by crazy people, and all other taxes are very problematic, but the income tax itself is higher than it should be, but they have to look everybody in the eye to raise taxes. And their governor spent $50 million of his own money to try and pass a constitutional amendment that the legislature cheerfully put on the ballot to say, let's go to a graduated progressive income tax, uh, and we'll tax rich people uh, first, then everybody else. Uh, what happened was the people of Illinois voted down moving to a graduated income tax on the same day they elected uh, Biden. Okay? So this was a Democrat left of center electorate, but they said they understood if we all have the same rate, we will all fight together against tax hikes. You can't take us. Graduated income taxes allow a politician to come in and say, well, I'm not going to tax you. This is how Clinton got elected, Obama got elected, and Biden got elected. I'm only going to tax the top 1% or 2% or people who make more than $400,000. They haven't finished that sentence. The rest of the sentence is, and then you. But um, I'm, going to, I'm just going to tax them. So the rest of you may want to walk out of this room because it's going to get a little noisy in here as I work these two guys over. Um, but it's not you. Okay, this is the Richard Speck theory of tax increases, that if you can't take on everybody in the room, you take them out of the room one at a time. With a single rate tax, you can't do that. Very difficult to raise. The counterpart to that is very easy to reduce. Much easier to take a 5% rate to 4 than to have bunches of rates and do the equivalent of take them all down by the same percentage, but not everybody looks at percentages and num that seems to be a bigger percentage than one rate. So getting to one rate puts you on the path to maybe being able to get to zero. Seven states do not tax personal income tax. There are 12 states now where I've worked with the governors, the state legislative leaders, and they said, we're going to zero. Arizona moved from 4.5% top rate down to flat rate of 2.5%. they are now committed to going to zero. Our friends in Kentucky have voted to phase down to zero. West Virginia has voted to phase down to zero. Uh, our, our friends in New Hampshire, they used to lie and tell you they had no income tax. They had no income tax on wages. They had a 5% tax on dividends and interest. The same as Massachusetts. Once you retired, it didn't do you any good to move to New Hampshire out of Massachusetts. That's now phased down. It will be zero January 1st, 2025. So they'll be coming along. North Dakota's been doing, uh, North, Dakota, North Dakota's committed to going to zero. They got from seven down to two. That's very good. Two is better, closer to one than seven. Um, and the governor's committed to going to zero. Uh, he's running for president right now. I hope that doesn't distract him. Iowa's taken their top rate, which was 8.6%. They're going to a single rate of 399 And the governor and the Senate leader said, and by the way, we're going to zero after that. So next door neighbors, Nebraska said, well, we're going to 3.9. Not 3.99 like you tax crazy people in Iowa. 3.9. Where did 3.99 come from? Oh, I don't know, just under Mississippi at 4. Okay. So th this is federalism is our friend. Federalism is our friend. These states are competing. I, I called one guy who, a Senate leader, we had a big fight earlier because he raised taxes, the jerk, um, and I called to try and to have a better relationship than that. 
and just told them about all the other states. And with four, four months later, they actually passed a bill to phase out their income tax uh, in their state. Because we have enough states that you can talk to, look at how they did it, and learn from them and feel fairly comfortable that you're not going to get over your ski tips. The way they're doing it, so, so if, if you're looking at a state, are they at a single rate? And are they committed to going to zero? If they're at a single rate, the chances of getting to go to zero is much greater. But the ones, the 12 that said we're going there, will probably get there first. North Carolina started the ball rolling. First thing they did was, well, we'll take the income tax and we'll drop it on the sales tax. And they'll go, whoa, there's no income tax. Well, that didn't work very well for them. Uh, and after they recovered from hitting the bridge abutment, they came back and said, here's what we're spending. When revenue pokes up above that line, we take some of it the teachers union gets to steal, but the rest of it goes into permanent reduction in the rate. And so every year the rate keeps coming down. Now, if there's a recession, then the rate doesn't go down that year, and you wait, and then it, as you get growth, it comes back again, and they're phasing it out to zero on that. So take a look at the state you're in, the state you're going to. All efforts to move to a single rate tax are worthwhile because they make it easier to go towards and to zero. All efforts to move away from a single rate tax are a disaster and to be avoided. Thanks. You guys make a couple of really good points about the states. And it's wonderful that we've got 50 opportunities that we can opt into or we can opt out of different tax regimes. It's especially important when you have states like California and Hawaii that are looking to tax new things uh, like wealth. I call those Star Trek taxes. The governor says we will boldly tax where no state has taxed before. The thing that you have to remember about states, though, is states have more ways to raise money than just income tax, specifically sales taxes and property taxes. Those can make a very big difference. We all know that California has the highest tax rate. We know that Texas has a 0% income tax. That's why so many people who used to live in neighborhoods like Encino and Walnut Creek now live in neighborhoods like Dallas and Austin. But if you're in the middle three quintiles of income distribution, you'll actually pay more in state and local taxes in Texas than you will in California because of the sales tax and the property tax and because California's tax is so progressive. It's an abused word, but we'll go ahead and use that. So the real bear that you have to fight is the federal government and the Internal Revenue Code with a top tax rate of 37% with an estate tax, if you're in a state tax territory that starts at 40%. That's where the real money is, and that's where planning comes in, because too many people look at the tax system as a once a year exercise. I go to my CPA, or I pay 100 bucks to TurboTax, and you know my CPA takes three weeks to get my return done, they do it for me, or I go to TurboTax and they're selling my data to Facebook and they're selling my data to Google. But it's a once a year exercise and then I get to forget about it for the rest of the year. And, and you can't do that. You can never forget about it for the rest of the year. And most Americans don't realize how much power they have to plan to pay less tax. If your sole source of income is a W-2 and you've got a few dollars in interest income from your local bank. There's not a whole lot of planning that you can do. But there are a lot of hidden opportunities to plan to pay less tax, particularly if you own a business of your own, if you own investment real estate, if you're managing a portfolio with taxable or even tax deferred assets. The key is sitting down and planning. The problem is the tax industrial complex doesn't do planning. They do compliance. Let me see a show of hands. How many of you, if your CPA has ever come to you and said, here's an idea that I think will save you money? I hear people laughing and I don't see hands going up. CPAs tell you how much you owe. They don't tell you how to pay less. Those are two very different things. I've spent 18 years of my career teaching CPAs how to sell tax planning. It is a tough sell. I mean, a typical CPA couldn't sell cocaine to Charlie Sheen, right? I mean, I'm picturing that, you know, Mr. Sheen, this is Norm Number Cruncher, your CPA, and I'm sitting on a mountain of fluffy white booger sugar. And Charlie's on the other end of the phone. He's saying, nah, man, you keep it. 
So the key is understanding how the federal tax system works for you, for your particular income, for your particular goals. And the goal isn't just to pay less tax. The goal is to accomplish your financial goals with a minimum of interference from the IRS. And then look at all of those planning opportunities. So I work with business owners who are looking to sell businesses and sell real estate. I'm working with a client right now who's selling a business and real estate for $46 million. He's not going to pay any income tax on that gain. North of $20 million of that sale is gain. And the amount of money that you can save through careful, proactive planning, it's staggering. I mean, now you guys know why tax lawyers drive Jaguars, because the money they can save is so big. So the key is understanding how the federal government taxes you, how your taxes on income work out, how your taxes on capital gains work out. If you're in an estate planning situation, you need to understand how income taxes affect estate taxes, because you can make smart income tax moves that actually cost you on a state tax, or you can make some smart strategic moves that can minimize income tax and transfer assets to your heirs at, gratefully, great, uh, at greatly discounted costs. So information is the key. The tax code is 100,000 pages of gobbledygook. There's actually a logic to it that a five-year-old can understand, and we'll talk about that in, in my later session, but Knowledge is the key, and you, you can't simply wait until April 15th to record last year's history to do it. It's the choices you make, the choices in where you live, whether you spend one day working in California. I don't do work in California because I don't want to pay California income tax. It's not worth it. You, you need to understand what you're getting into, so it's, uh, it's offense. Tax planning is the key to your financial defense. You know, you can, you can spend a lot of effort making money as an investor or a business owner. That's your financial offense. Financial defense is spending less. For many of you, taxes are your biggest single expense. So start there. I mean, yeah, you can save 15% on your car insurance by switching to GEICO. But what's that going to do for you in the long run? Well, thank you, gentlemen, for this scratching of the surface, truly, when it comes to taxes. Please find them and visit their sessions for more in-depth information. And as always, they'll be at my booth, Freedom Fest TV, for more interviews. Real quick, Daniel, do you have a website? Taxfoundation.org. Grover? ATR.org. ExcelEmpire.com. Excellent. Thank you all for joining us here. And enjoy the rest of Freedom Fest, everyone. Woo, let's hear it. Give it up. Save us from taxes. You guys are amazing. Crushing. See? How much have you learned today? How much have you grown? Do you know people who maybe made bad investments in college and went to private colleges that were very, very expensive that they couldn't afford and they took out loans and now they expect the two thirds of Americans who didn't go to college to pay for their bad college choices? Well, you know, you can't unring the bell. So if you've already gone and gotten a four year degree that's too expensive for uh, what you're bringing in, the government shouldn't be the one, we shouldn't be on the hook for it, but there are solutions and there's only one man who can help people get out of their student loan shackles. That is Lane Schoenberger. He's the co-founder of Why Refi. Lane, let's hear it. Hey, Sean, and let's hear it for Lane. Are you worried about investing in the stock street. market, especially with Joe Biden as your president? Do you really trust this economy? What if you can invest in a secure, collateralized portfolio with a high fixed rate of return that's not correlated to the stock market or the Fed? A portfolio where you will know what each monthly statement will look like with no surprises. Now, your interest is compounded daily, you're paid monthly, and there are no fees. You can turn your income on or off, compound it, or whatever else you choose. And get this. 
There's absolutely no loss in principle if you ever need your money back. Just go to investyrefi.com. That's invest, the letter Y, R-E-F-Y, dot com, or give them a call, 1-888-Y-REFI-24. You can earn a fixed rate of return of up to 10.25%. Now just call 888-Y-R-E-F-Y-24, or just go to their website, and that's invest, the letter Y, refi, dot com, and tell them your friend Sean Hannity sent you. And tell them Dr. G sent you. Tell them Clay and Buck sent you. And tell them Jesse Kelly sent you. And tell them Charlie Kirk sent you. And tell them Dennis Prager sent you. Good morning. I thank you very much for taking the time to come in and, and listen to our very brief presentation. You know, getting endorsements from folks like that, Larry Elder and, and, the, and the likes, we take it very seriously. Uh, they, they do their due diligence. They don't just go and randomly uh, endorse companies, particularly ones that are asking you to invest. So why refi? This is, this is the opportunity for capitalism in America to actually do something to fix the private student loan market. Uh, we don't have much control over the federal student loans, but, uh, oh, there we go, hitting the wrong button. So we, we have a, what's called a Regulation D, 506C investment opportunity for accredited investors with a minimum investment of $50,000. And what we have is an opportunity for you to earn a fixed return in a secured collateralized portfolio. These are, again, fixed interest rates. And what we do is we compound daily or calculate your interest on a daily basis and make monthly payments of interest only to you as an investor. Uh, you do have the opportunity to turn that interest income on or off, up or down by 1% increments or by dollar amount in each individual tranche that you may have money invested in. Uh, so you have complete and total control over your investment. You can invest through a what's called a non-qualified account, so individual, joint, trust, uh, LLC, or a qualified account, for example, in your retirement, IRA. Uh, there is a liquidity feature, structured very similar to a CD. If you need a portion or all of your money back, the penalty is only interest. There is no attack on your principal. We also offer something called a roll-up. If you are in a situation where, you, 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 let's say you're in the three-year note, seven and a half percent interest, at the end of three years you say, gosh, I sure like this, I'd like to be in that five-year note, but I don't want to be in for five full years. What you do, lock in your interest at the end of three years, it is now yours. We then roll you up to the five-year and give you two years at 10 and a quarter. Come by the booth, we'll explain more in detail, and I'll go into much more detail about what the secured collateralized portion is. We only have a few minutes up here, so. Just share this with you. This is kind of fun when we get into uh, how we work with our, our people that are endorsing us. Uh, Larry Elder, by the way, he's going to be in our booth today. Uh, we just talked to him a little bit ago. He's wandering around right now somewhere, but uh, he'll be in our booth today from 1 to 2.30, and then again tomorrow and Saturday. And I know he's a keynote speaker at the uh, wrap-up dinner here. Uh, some of these folks you'll, you'll know, and maybe you won't, but Chuck Warren and Sam Stone, they have a, a radio show called Breaking Battlegrounds. At the end of this month, they'll be in 21 markets, growing quickly. Uh, it's, it's kind of a neat show. Uh, Sam actually is on our staff now. Sam loved what we were doing so much, he, he came in and said, I want to be a part of this. So, you know, Sam's over in our booth. You get a chance to meet him. James T. Harris, uh, some of you guys know Dennis Prager. Uh, Prager University. He he really enjoys what we do. Uh, great great conversations with him. And again, we don't take these endorsements lightly. They're 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 very important to us. Um, so with all that being said, you know, take a take a moment. Come by the booth. We have a free gift for you. A nice big canvas bag to carry your uh, your stuff around from here at the Freedom Fest. Uh, James T. Harris. If you know who James T. is, he'll be uh, flying in later this afternoon. He'll join us in our booth as well, along with Larry. Um, We'd love to tell you more about why refi and how we are how we are helping borrowers get out of debt. And by the way, they're doing remarkably well. Our borrowers are are less than a two percent default rate. They are crushing it. So it's fantastic and fun to watch them win, uh, and our investors win as a, as a result of that. It's a true what we call a win 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 scenario. The borrowers win, the investors win, the lenders, the servicers, agencies, collection for they all win. Um, and, and it's fun to see people actually getting ahead in this world through capitalism uh, and, and constructive ideas. So please come by and visit us. We would really appreciate your uh, opportunity to visit with you, get to know you, and ask us any questions about who we are and what we do. Thank you very much.
you have to walk like this when you wear opera gloves. Um, how is everybody doing? Wonderful. Love the energy. Love the crowd. Uh, love the fact that, that you are receptive, warm, and welcoming. Coming up, uh, uh, this is a man who has used FOIA like a mighty sword uh, to bring down the obfuscators and the weenuses. So he has been instrumental in bringing to light things like Hillary's emails and Dr. Fauci's gain-of-function research. It's not gain-of-function, it's science. Okay, you don't understand science. Because it's not gain-of-function, it's something completely different called gain-of-function. If you knew science, you would know. He is the founder of Judicial Watch, and thank goodness we have this man watching, because otherwise, what happens in darkness will destroy us all. He is bringing the light. Let's bring some love for Tom Fitton. Hello, Freedom Fest. Thanks for having me. Well, you know, as Kennedy said, Judicial Watch is your watchdog in Washington. You know, I'd hate to think where our nation would be without Judicial Watch. Hillary, Bill, Barack, Joe, Al. You remember Al Gore, right? George W., Dick, Nancy, Adam, Eric, Chuck, Schumer, that is. All those politicians have faced accountability and investigations from your friendly neighborhood Judicial Watch. And, you know, let me give you some idea about the consequences of our work. President Hillary Clinton, not. Judicial Watch changed history by uncovering Hillary's emails. Sorry, Hillary. And dare I say it, we say President Trump. President Trump could have been driven out of office by the deep state Obama, Clinton, Biden gang if Judicial Watch hadn't taken the lead early in exposing the Russia hoax against him. We exposed key elements of the worst corruption scandal in American history, which was the Obama-Clinton gang seditious conspiracy against Trump. Obama was in on it, Clinton was in on it, Biden was in on it, Comey was in on it, Brennan was in on it, McCabe was in on it, Strzok was in on it, Clapper was in on it, Schiff was in on it, the FBI and DOJ were in on it. The CIA was in on it. The State Department was in on it. And now Garland is, on, is in on it. And Soros' buddy Alvin Bragg is in on it. And, of course, Jack Smith is now in on it. And they're all part of the worst corruption scandals, I said, in American history. They all are in on the truth that Trump is innocent. But nevertheless, they sneered and spied on him. Now they want to jail him on the eve of an election. Nixon is a saint compared to this crew that wants to make Trump and other innocent Americans political prisoners of Rico Joe. The country would have been better off if Judicial Watch were special counsel. Durham's investigation was a fail. We didn't need a report. We needed prosecutions. Never has so much government corruption faced so little government accountability. You know, the left, though, is telling us what to do, right? They're, they're targeting uh, uh, groups and citizens and issues, and it's alerting us to what we should be defending. The left is attacking parents who are trying to hold school boards accountable for the targeting of their children with Marxist anti-American critical race theory. That means we have to embrace the rights of parents to direct the education of their children. The left is attacking government transparency by, again, attacking parents, honest members of Congress, there are a few, and other citizens for daring to ask questions about what our government is up to. That means we should embrace and expand government transparency because big government and big corruption are the handmaidens of big, excuse me, big gov government and big corruption and big secrecy are the handmaidens of big corruption. The left is attacking the courts. They hate Justice Thomas and other Supreme Court conservatives who want to apply the law rather than legislate from the bench. 
we must protect the courts from court packing and outright intimidation if we want to preserve the rule of law. The left is attacking the right to life, promoting abortion up until birth and frankly even beyond in some circumstances. That means we should embrace life, protect the unborn, and oppose the culture of death. The left is attacking sovereignty and citizenship, with Biden allowing an outright invasion of America. We should embrace the rule of law and immigration by securing our borders and requiring every illegal alien to return home. The left is attacking our children, pushing sex talk, transgender extremist ideology, and noxious, po noxious politics in our schools. We should reject this demonic assault on the innocence of children and stand fast against leftist efforts to mutilate their bodies and minds. And I'm sure you're talking about this this week. The left is attacking the First Amendment and free speech like never before, especially online. We should embrace the First Amendment and reject the politicized censorship of our God-given, let me say it again, God-given free speech rights, especially in the modern public square of the Internet. And of course, the left hates the constitutional principle of equal treatment under the law, no matter your race. They promote racial discrimination, racial division, and blatant segregation. We should embrace equal treatment under the law and reject the repackaged malicious Marxism of critical race theory. And of course, the left is attacking elections, making it easier to steal elections with unsupervised voting, which is mass mail-in voting, no voter ID, and the counting of ballots for forever and a day. You know, it's not supposed to be an election month. It's supposed to be an election day, people. And if you raise questions about their schemes, as we've seen what they're doing with the January 6th prosecutions, they were literally trying to push you to jail. We should embrace secure elections that aren't rigged by big tech or the FBI. And of course, you know, the left is assaulting Judicial Watch. I had some skin cancer surgery last November, and a few hours after I get home, I'm recovering on the couch, FBI knocking at my door with a grand jury subpoena. Nice agents, they did tell me there was an Amazon package there too. But they hassled and abused me, the Justice Department under Biden, for four hours over Trump documents and what I had for lunch with President Trump at the White House. It was a partisan fishing expedition that lasted four hours. It was like being on MSNBC or a CNN town hall for an afternoon. It was that bad. But let me be clear. The Bush administration, with its prosecution of Trump, is now officially a regime. I know because, I, as I said, I witnessed the abuse firsthand. I know it seems like things are dire, and I won't beat around the bush they are. Our president is compromised by his family business, which is racketeering and money laundering. Cocaine in the White House is the least of his corruption problems. In addition to the corruption crisis, we're in a revolutionary period where these communists think that they can undo our Republican form of government. All I can say is thank heaven for Judicial Watch. Judicial Watch is America's largest and most effective government watchdog group. The left starts sweating when we start foying. We smash through stone walls to get to the truth. For example, we exposed the Fauci gang uh, was funding mutant virus gain of function research in Wuhan. And mutant, by the way, is their word, not mine. Judicial Watch also stands strong for free, fair, and honest elections. Earlier this year, LA County removed 1.2 million names, dirty names from their voter rolls thanks to a Judicial Watch federal lawsuit settlement. And that was followed up by settlements in other states. And just within the last year or so, Judicial Watch is responsible for cleaning up to two million names from the voting rolls. And more is coming. And we're in Illinois, challenging that state's law, allowing the counting of mail ballots that arrive up to two weeks after election day, even without a postmark. What, what on earth is going on in Illinois? Why does the left oppose voter ID, clean election rolls, and other basic security measures? I mean, do I have to tell you why? They want to be able to steal elections when necessary.
the left got their way, tens of millions of foreigners would be able to vote in our elections, just like they were able to do in local elections back in D.C. That's right. They spent their time smearing conservatives in favor of foreign interference while giving the Russians and the Chinese ambassadors and illegal aliens the right to vote in D.C. Heck, the Russian ambassador could be mayor of D.C. That music for me. So Judicial Watch is on point in protecting the rule of law on all of these issues, whether it be elections, transparency, illegal immigration, censorship, you name it. When it comes to taking on government corruption, Judicial Watch is second to none. Judicial Watch is the model, and Congress has followed our lead, but they have to do more. Let me suggest to the House, we want accountability. That means criminal referrals, funding cuts, protection from illegal abuse and firings. And what about impeachment? There's a lot of heavy lifting to do. I'm up for it, but it's lightweight if we take on the challenges together. Stand up for freedom. Stand up for your rights. Ah, oh, heck, Tom! <laughs> Our republic. <laughs> Thank you, Kennedy. I, I'll just say, times are serious, folks. Our republic is tottering and could topple thanks to the new Marxist corruption affecting our politics. We have no choice but to win. You must be heroes of the republic. Stand strong. God bless you, and God bless America. Well done. Beautifully done. Tom Fitton. Let's hear it. I knew they would love it. Thank you, Tom, and thanks to all of you. We know that there are drugs and tools and innovations out there that we don't have access to. And some people have precious little time, yet still the government, the FDA, stands in the way of true innovation. Well, at uh, Zicha Genesis Medicine, they are just carving new paths, and they have some incredible technologies, but more importantly, they have results that uh, they cannot access in this country because of bodies like the FDA. Uh, fortunately, we have a miraculous panel right now, headed by Dr. Jack Jacobs. He is the chief science officer at uh, Zicha Genesis. And the hard work and the stories will blow your mind. But uh, what's even more insane is the people in this country can't access the care and the tools that the people have you're about to meet on stage. So Dr. Jack Jacobs from Zetra is going to lead this. So a round of applause for Medical Miracles. Here is Dr. Jack Jacobs. Good to be here. Uh, I'm going to be talking about some treatments, some new treatments we're developing for, among other things, Parkinson's disease. And I'm fortunate to have two of our subjects who participated in the trial sitting next to me, Lisa and Bonnie, and you'll hear a few words from them as well. So let me tell you a little bit about the medicine, uh, and then our CEO at the end there will talk about the obstacles we had from our own FDA to treat patients with Parkinson's disease. But we've found a, a way around that. It's all legal, and we'll tell you how we did that. So let me just give you some examples. We're treating some very serious diseases. Uh, we're treating severe heart disease, coronary artery disease, stroke, and then I'll end up talking about our work with Parkinson's disease. So with coronary artery disease, we all know this is results from blocked arteries in the heart, and we actually inject a growth factor which can stimulate uh, the growth of new blood vessels in the heart. So a surgeon makes a little incision right there uh, in the chest between the ribs, and we actually inject our medicine directly into the beating heart. And 12 weeks later, there's a whole network of new blood vessels which grow 
and these patients uh, do much better on their treadmill testing and with their uh, chest pain. So let me show you an actual patient we treated in that trial. Uh, actually, ABC News came to our site, it was in Cincinnati, interviewed our cardiologist and, and the patient, and you'll see in this short video clip the actual blood vessels uh, growing in this uh, woman's heart. But since receiving an experimental treatment for his blocked arteries, his pain is gone. I really feel great. Duke was one of the first heart patients in the country to be treated with a protein actually capable of growing brand new arteries. The genetically engineered protein is injected directly into the heart. Within days, a network of new vessels begins to grow around the blockage, increasing the blood supply. Dr. Lynn Wagner showed us the changes in one patient's heart. We see a small, narrow main artery and not very many secondary and tertiary arteries. This is after the treatment. What we're now seeing is new blood vessels growing here uh, off the, the end of this artery. And the patients themselves? Symptomatically, they're improved within a couple of weeks of the treatment. Just ask Constance Donnelly. Oh, I feel wonderful. I've never felt so good in the last five years. It's what doctors already see potential in other cases where the blood supply needs a boost, such as strokes and diabetes. So that woman you saw, Constance Donnelly, she came into the trial as a cardiac cripple. She was in a wheelchair, and that was her uh, 12 weeks later. Uh, we want to restart these trials. We submitted an application to our US FDA. We have all this human data. We've treated over 40 people with heart disease. They said, no, you've got to go back and do animal studies again. You've got to kill rats and dogs. And we just said, no, thank you. And we <clears throat> went around them, and we're now treating, we'll be treating patients in the Caribbean. This is our growth factor. It's called fibroblast growth factor. It's a simple protein. You all use it all the time. You cut yourself, your body will make this FGF1 fibroblast growth factor and it stimulates new blood vessels to heal wounds. Uh, in the brain, it stimulates new blood vessels, which is linked to new nerves. So in Parkinson's disease, we're regenerating not only blood vessels in the brain, but new dopamine neurons. These are the neurons that become dysfunctional in Parkinson's disease. Let me just show you, we will be treating, we treated our first stroke patient, stroke disability patient in the British Virgin Islands. Uh, and just very quickly, I'll show you, we first have to do animal experiments, so you can give a, uh, a mouse a stroke by tying off a small artery in the mouse's brain. Uh, we then can give the animal either sugar water, placebo, or we can give them our drug, FGF1, and look at the size of the stroke in the animal. So these are brain slices through a mouse's brain. I tell my audience, if you believe in reincarnation, you don't want to come back as a laboratory mouse. It's, it's not a good life. So uh, <clears throat> on the left there, you can see uh, the white area is the stroke area, the infarcted area. On the right is uh, an, other mice that were treated with FGF1. You can see the nice healing. If we look at the actual blood vessels formed, you can see up top there, that's capillaries in a normal mouse. Uh, you give that animal a stroke, you can see in the middle, the blood vessels get decimated, and then when we treat with FGF1, we grow them back very nicely. In the bottom, uh, that's a placebo treatment. The brain is desperately trying to get new blood vessels going, but it does not do a very good job. Then importantly, to show that we're regenerating neurons in the mouse's brain, we put them on a rotating black bar there. On the left, the normal mice grab on uh, very well, and there in the middle are our mice that were given a stroke and then treated with our FGF1, grabbing on. Those treated with the placebo on the right have fallen off that rotating bar. So with this data, we're ready to put this into the clinic, and we'll be starting treating patients who have had a stroke, have stabilized, but have a disability, and we'll try to get uh, regain of function in those patients. Finally, I'd like to end with our work on Parkinson's disease. Uh, we and others believe Parkinson's disease is actually a vascular disease in the brain. So you get choking off of blood vessels which uh, supply the dopamine neurons. And these are the neurons that are very critical for movement. And once they become dysfunctional, you get the classical motor symptoms of Parkinson's, the tremors and the gait disturbances. Uh, we first tested <clears throat> our drug in a monkey model. This is the gold standard before going into humans. And 
you can see there on the bottom, I don't take too much time, on the bottom, those brown areas, there are newly regenerated dopamine neurons. And the top, the placebo-treated animals do not regrow these neurons that are needed uh, for proper motor skills. Also in Parkinson's disease, like Alzheimer's, you get an accumulation of plaques in the brain. So with Alzheimer's, it's a beta amyloid plaque. In Parkinson's disease, you can see in the middle that tangle of proteins that's an alpha synuclein plaque. That, again, is toxic to the dopamine neurons in the brains of these monkeys and also in the patients. And you can see on the right, when we treat the animals with FGF1, we have much less of that toxic tangle of proteins. So we believe the uh, better blood perfusion is kind of flushing out the, that toxic material. And this just shows movement score. So up four is normal movement of the monkeys. Uh, as you go down, it's uh, abnormal movement. And at the end of the experiment, if you look way to the right, the blue group, they were treated with FGF1. They're almost back to normal movement, where the animals treated with the placebo in red still have all the uh, motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. OK, so we, uh, <clears throat> again, applied to our US FDA to treat patients in the United States. They wanted additional animal studies. Yeah. And <clears throat> We now are treating uh, patients with an intranasal device where we can squirt the FGF1 uh, up the nose. And you can see uh, through the trigeminal nerve and uh, olfactory nerve, we can get it into the brain. And this shows uh, some of our first treated patients. Uh, on the left will be before, and on the right will be uh, 30 days after treatment. And you can see here the, the tremors on the left. And then on the right, this is 30 days after she received uh, treatment. So another fellow from Texas, you can see, has a very pronounced tremor uh, in his right arm. He's a golfer. Uh, he's from Texas. You can see his Dallas Cowboy shorts he's wearing. Uh, he's going to stand up here. Give us a, oh, This is a resting tremor he's showing. Okay, and then he's sent us a video from himself. This is after treatment. He's at an airport bar. We don't encourage our patients to drink alcohol. But remember, his right hand was shaking tremendously, and he's now there. Okay, so to summarize, we've treated almost 70 patients to date. The drug is safe. We get good improvement in all the patients. And... Uh, Two of our patients are here. Lisa O'Loughlin is here from Oregon. Let me just show you real quick. We have a video of her. This is her to my left. This is uh, before she was treated with FGF1. This is in the British Virgin Islands. And she had a wedding coming up. She said she wanted to be able to dance at her daughter's wedding. And here's Lisa uh, three months later, I believe. Yeah, okay. There she is dancing. Okay, good morning, Memphis. How are you doing? My name's Lisa Laughlin, and, and I am from Oregon. Um, I, have, I was diagnosed about eight years ago, so uh, I've been on this path for a while. I just wanted to say, you know, on national TV, I'm so thankful that I serve such an amazing God. He, my Savior, has taking me down this path. And I would really like to thank Dan Montano and Dr. Jacobs for really relentlessly pursuing this concept because nobody else is. And they are all over it. I have found them with a lot of integrity and I consider them friends. So I would like to just say thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bonnie Lyons from California. You want to pass her over the microphone here? Okay, there we go. Good morning. My name is Bonnie Lyons. I live in San Diego, California. I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease 15 years ago at the age of 52. And let me tell you, I was devastated. In fact, I went into denial and stayed there for a long time. I did, however, seek, you know, medical care. I feel I received some of the best care from University of California, San Diego's Movement Center. 
But you know, that wasn't enough. I wasn't getting any better. I had a wonderful career at Northrop Grumman as a contracts manager, which I lost in 2020 due to my Parkinson's. Since that time, I've become a fighter. I do this by leaning forward. I'm willing to look into and take into consideration any out-of-the-box treatments. In my research, I found Zetra and FGF1. I told myself, I said, if I do nothing, nothing changes. If I do something, I have everything to gain. Oh, sorry. After COVID, I considered all my options and decided that Zetra was in my best interest. I participated in cohort number four in October of 2022. The treatment exceeded all my expectations. Two to three weeks after my treatment, great things started to happen for me. I first noticed I felt sharper. I remembered I was just faster. My cognitive abilities, oh my gosh, they came back. As I have been, and I have been able to decrease my current, my current medicines, excuse me. I feel terrible, uh, terrific, excuse me, I feel terrific. And I believe re that receiving um, FGF1 is, was one of the best decisions I've made in my life. Having said that, I close this part of the story with a sense of hope. Hope that I now ha can have a better life and, and have a normal life without Parkinson's. In the last 30 seconds, I have a five-minute presentation. We're in booth 500. We have other treatments we're working on, cancer, stroke. We've dosed our first autism patient. You can come through and you can see the medical breakthrough we do. We're going to change the outcome. We're, getting, we're dealing with the FDA because we're here to tell you we're going to show that we can treat Parkinson's, cancer, autism, and when the people know it, the FDA will be giving us permission. I have four seconds left. Thank you. It. I told you. Have I failed you yet? Don't answer that. So if in 2020 you had on your bingo card the Liberty Ninja who would turn party politics on its head, I would have high-fived you. I would have been excited about this 21-year-old who ran for office and won elected office at the House State of Representatives in Hawaii at 31, became a Congresswoman. She is a Lieutenant Colonel in the Army Reserves. She eviscerated Kamala Harris in one paragraph. She stood up to Hillary Clinton and the disinformation machine by calling her queen of the warmongers. She is awesome, she is right, and she is here. Give it up for former Congresswoman and my friend Double Shakas for Tulsi Gabbard. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Kennedy is a fellow surfer, if you didn't know. And the last time I did an interview with her on her show at the very end, she was asking about the surf in Hawaii, and she threw up double shakas, the whale tip. So anyway, inside joke. It is so great to be here with all of you at such a critical and important time. I'm grateful that you have taken on this most critical cause of defending our freedom. And we hear the Star Spangled Banner. We read the words on the page. We talk about... America, the United States of America being the land of the free and the home of the brave. But unfortunately, we are at a place and time in this country where increasingly our freedom is being called into question and in some cases is being directly undermined. And it is the Democrat elite in Washington and the permanent establishment of the war machine made up of people from both political parties 
who in their blind pursuit of power are doing all that they can to undermine our individual rights and freedoms. Now, I served in Congress for eight years, and I wish I could stand here and tell you, well, we'll give them a benefit of the doubt that they have somehow forgotten the oath that they took to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. They have forgotten the intent of our founders about what they envisioned for this country. Maybe they've forgotten that our founders recognized that power and liberty are natural enemies. Maybe they've forgotten that our founders saw in themselves their most important task to contain government power and protect individual liberties, recognizing that our unalienable rights and freedoms are not given to us by any individual or government entity and therefore cannot be taken away by any individual or government entity. When I was in Congress, first year I was there, I was excited to learn about a tradition that occurs every year where members of Congress go to the House floor and each take turns reading portions of the Constitution out loud while in session. So I went and was glad to participate, but there weren't very many people there. I asked some of my Democrat colleagues at the time, I said, hey, did you know this was going on? Are you going to go down and participate? And most of the responses that I got was a scoff, saying, oh, that's just a right-wing Republican stunt. I was shocked. I was shocked. But when you look at the actions that are taking place, the policies that they're pushing forward, their complete uh, disregard for the Constitution, then you can understand how the two match. And that's the unfortunate reality, is you can't give them the benefit of the doubt. It's not that they have forgotten their oath, they just don't care. They don't care about individual rights and freedoms. They don't care about our Constitution. What they care about is power and putting their own self-serving interests above all else. Now, we're seeing how they are doing that with our rights and freedoms under an almost constant barrage. And I'll go through a few quickly. Freedom of speech, right? Freedom of speech is something that used to be almost universally accepted as something that every one of us must defend and protect, regardless of our politics or affiliations or whether or not we liked what someone else had to say. We knew every one of us has a right to exercise that right to freedom. That's not the case anymore. This open marketplace of ideas that our founders envisioned for us is being shut down left and right, whether it is in person or in that virtual marketplace of ideas. Our Second Amendment rights, our right to self-defense and to protect ourselves against a tyrannical government, we're seeing this in everything from the recent ban on pistol braces by the ATF and even the Department of Defense and the VA putting forward egregious policies that directly undermine the Second Amendment rights of our servicemen and women and veterans. See, religious freedom, our right to worship as we choose or not at all, is especially being targeted against Christians, peaceful pro-life protesters. We see these efforts to try to erase any mention of God from our public life. The continued assault on our privacy and civil liberties goes on. We heard about the recent FBI's tens of thousands of violations of the FISA Section 702. We see Congress on the verge of what appears to be yet another rubber stamp approval for the Patriot Act. Unfortunately, this list of violations is long in the ways that they're trying to undermine our rights and exercise their government power over our individual liberties. And in this, this blind pursuit and hunger for power, they've created in themselves a monster that's willing to do whatever they deem necessary to increase their power. And one of the tactics that they often use, we've seen unfortunately all too often even in the recent history, is the exploitation of crises or the creation of crises and emergencies or new wars of choice, whether they be economic wars or kinetic wars, cold wars or hot wars, they use these events to try to stoke fear in the people, to force us into submission, 
and use the power of the national security state and law enforcement to infringe on our rights and liberties and to force us to face consequences if we refuse to submit. James Madison warned us about this when he said, of all the enemies to public liberty, war is perhaps the most to be dreaded because it comprises and develops the germ of every other. He said, no nation could preserve its freedom in the midst of continual warfare. That's what we have seen through most of my adult life. It's what I have experienced as a soldier in seeing the cost and consequences of war. Yes, in human lives. Yes, in taxpayer dollars. And also in the cost of the violation of our rights and freedoms. You know, when I served in Congress, I, I served on the Armed Services and Foreign Affairs Committees for most of the eight years that I was there. And I was astounded by the fact that every time the Patriot Act reauthorization came up, there were those of us, myself, Tom Massey, and others who recognized how deeply these laws had been violated and abused in the name of national security to go after our individual liberties. And so we introduced legislation to fix this egregious problem, this unconstitutional abuse of power. And every time we did so, there was a bipartisan response calling us traitors, accusing us of welcoming another 9-11 style terrorist attack on America, further fomenting this fear in order to hide what they were really doing. We saw egregious overreach during the COVID pandemic, where the government attempted to, and in many cases were successful in controlling even the most personal parts of our lives, and they continued to ratchet up those measures of control because they saw they could get away with it. They saw there was no accountability, there was no, no consequences. They saw how they could smear and shut down and silence anyone who dared not only to challenge them, but to merely ask questions. And we're seeing the same thing play out now. We have two new Cold Wars being waged against Russia and China. They're working with their friends in the propaganda media and, and in big tech to push their own narrative, but also to undermine the free speech and rights of anyone who dares to ask the questions every one of us should be asking as Americans, the questions every member of Congress should be asking, what is the true cost of these wars? What, how will they impact the everyday lives of the American people? How do they serve the best interests of the American people? A few months ago, Representative Comer, the head of the Oversight Committee, introduced legislation called the Protecting Speech from Government Interference Act. And it did exactly as it's titled. It would have prohibited federal officials from doing anything to squelch or censor free speech on the internet. Now, I know you guys are gonna be hearing from Matt Taibbi later, but he did an important job in exposing how the FBI both directly and indirectly got Twitter to silence certain people's voices. Now they will say, well, this was done to silence Russian bots or prevent foreign governments from spreading disinformation online, but the reality was most of the people that they were censoring were Americans. They were members of Congress, like myself. They were small business owners. They were heads of nonprofits. They were other journalists. They were everyday Americans who happened to disagree with the narrative of permanent Washington and the Biden administration, and therefore needed to be silenced. Now, every single Republican in Congress voted for this. Every single Democrat voted against it. Their reason, they said, well, the government has an important role to play in making sure, quote unquote, disinformation is silenced in this country. And who gets to decide what disinformation is? They do. They have appointed themselves as the sole authority who gets to determine what is information versus disinformation. And I want to share with you two quotes from Democrats in Congress that, that kind of stopped me in my tracks. First is Representative Goldman, who's a Democrat from New York. He said that voting against the resolution was a way to stand, quote, with free speech and American democracy. 
That's a direct quote. Because he feels that the government has the responsibility to stop Russia and China from spreading disinformation. So what is disinformation in their eyes? Well, we know this from what they've done. Disinformation is censoring the contents of Hunter Biden's laptop from voters so that they didn't have the chance to see what was, what was really going on before the 2020 election. There are a lot of other examples we could point to there. There's a representative landsman from Ohio who said, quote, why are we being asked to ban American officials from trying to stop propaganda from foreign adversaries like Putin? Why are some proposing we leave Syria, which Putin wants? Why is the call to abandon Ukraine continuing to emerge from some members? He goes on to say, remember, and I'm quoting him, remember, Hitler did this. He used Americans to spread his propaganda and it cost millions their lives. Putin is doing the same thing. So to be clear, this congressman from Ohio feels that Americans who dare to say, hey, we need to stop writing blank checks to fund this proxy war against Russia via Ukraine must be silenced. He feels that anyone who says, hey, we need to bring our troops home from Syria are Russian propagandists and must be silenced. This is dangerous because this is coming from people who are in great positions of power to actually act on this nonsense. Now, so far, the Senate has refused to take up this legislation that was passed by Republicans in the House. The court has taken action, banning the federal government from having any contact with social media companies for the purpose of censoring free speech. The Biden administration's response, again, was very bold. They are blatant. They're not even trying to hide it. They said that they're challenging this ruling because they're concerned it will limit their attempts to counter domestic extremism. Who gets to say what domestic extremism is? Well, we can look to them because we know what they say. President Biden declared MAGA Republicans and Trump supporters as the greatest threat to our democracy. Maybe he's referring to, maybe they're referring domestic extremists to the, quote, radical traditional Catholics that the FBI has deemed a threat. Why? Well, in part because they prefer traditional Latin mass. Maybe it's the parents who are going to Board of Education meetings and protesting against the overt sex sexualization of their kids that's happening in our schools or those who stand up and protest the irreversal mutilation of our kids in the name, name of gender-affirming care. These are the people that our government, the Biden administration, sees as domestic extremists. These are the people that they want to silence. The Biden administration also expressed that this court ruling would cause, quote, great harm. They're telling the truth it would cause great harm to their power, to their ability to control us by controlling what information we are allowed to read, what we are exposed to, whose voices we are allowed to hear. What's dangerous about all this is they're directly and indirectly using the national security state and law enforcement, the propaganda media and big tech, all working together in this cabal to silence those who hold views they find objectionable and therefore who threaten their power. They try to intimidate us into silence, into self-censorship by using their smear, attack, and destroy tactics. Hillary Clinton used it against me during the 2020 presidential campaign when she said I'm a traitor, a lie that was repeated over and over and over again. People actually believed this baseless lie. Mitt Romney called me a treasonous liar, which as a soldier is an offense punishable by death. Again, presenting no evidence, but calling me this because I said, hey, there are U.S. funded bio labs in Ukraine that the Department of Defense has reported that in the midst of a war could be compromised and create yet another global pandemic and crisis. We should probably do something about that. 
that was grounds for being called a treasonous liar. Anyone who stands up and says, hey, we should not be the policemen of the world. We should not be waging regime change wars around the world. Their, their label for us is, you're a dictator lover, lover. You're a stooge for whatever dictator is in question. Senator Rand Paul being called a, a Putin puppet because he says we should have some accountability for the money and weapons that we are sending to Ukraine. Reasonable request in the wake of all of the waste and fraud and abuse that we saw for the last 20 years in Afghanistan and Iraq. We're seeing the same thing happen with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. right now. They're throwing everything but the kitchen sink at him to try to discredit him as a person and call his character into question so that voters don't pay attention to him. They've used these tactics over and over and over again because they work. Most people don't want to go through what we have been through and what we continue to go through. Most people don't want to be called these names. Most people don't want to be on the receiving end of these attacks and therefore resort to self-censorship. There's no accountability. There's no check on this abuse of power, not even from the media. We have rare uh, journalism coming from people like Matt Taibbi and Glenn Greenwald who have the courage to speak the truth, but more and more we see journalism is gone. That fourth estate that we used to be able to trust to speak the truth, to speak truth to power, to tell us what we need to know that the government wouldn't, is largely gone. So the hypocrisy that we're seeing now in the Biden administration in permanent Washington is the fact that we live in a country where they are directly undermining our democracy and freedom here at home while President Biden goes around the world saying the heart of my foreign policy is to spread democracy and defeat autocracy. And he's doing so with the support of the neocon neolib foreign policy establishment. We're just like here at home, they get to decide whose voices they want to hear or allow us to hear and who must be silenced. Similarly, in foreign policy, they decide which democracies are acceptable and which are not, which autocracies they like and want to support and which they don't. The bottom line is they care about power. That's what drives them. They don't care about us. They don't care about our democracy. And they are trying so hard to silence us because why? Ultimately, they are afraid. They are driven by fear. They're afraid of a free people who think for themselves. They're afraid of a free society. Thomas Jefferson called out their cowardice when he said they prefer the calm of despotism to the boisterous sea of liberty. So the ball is in our court. We cannot allow them to continue to destroy our country. We cannot allow them to continue to undermine our fundamental rights and freedoms. We have to stand up and protect them. We have to stand up and exercise them. We have to hold them to account in the ballot box, at the courts, and in the public, public marketplace of ideas. It's up to us. This is a no-fail mission. If we love this country, if we care about our freedoms, it's up to us to take action to save them. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for all you're doing. Aloha. Thank you. I love who she is. I love her message. I love who she has become as a political figure, uh, but more importantly, just an amazing person. All right, so we have much more to go. We don't want globalists running our lives. They think they can control the world, and they know better than we do because they hate the idea of individualism. Uh, but there has to be a better way of doing things. So now we're going to hear about unleashing freedom and self-organization around the globe to increase individual liberty and freedom uh, with young Brad Lips, who is the chief executive officer of Atlas Network. It is a position that he has been in since 2009. He is ruling it. He has incredible ideas and a couple of friends 
to talk about the anti-Davos brigade. So let's hear it for Brad Lipt from Atlas Network and his lovely cohorts. All right. Well, thank you so much, Kennedy. It is exciting to be here at Freedom Fest. I'm, I'm Brad Lips. I'm the CEO of Atlas Network, which is the global organization, the global network that advances freedom. And that's where I get to work alongside these two individuals, the lovely and brilliant Magat Wade. Woo, there we go. <laughs> And also, um, I, I like to call him uh, the Liberty Movement's most learned swashbuckler who adventures around the world promoting freedom, Dr. Tom Palmer. And we've, uh, we've got 20 minutes, and we've set ourselves a goal of cheering everybody up. Because when you look at the headlines day to day, whether you're looking at the headlines here in the States or around the world, it's very easy to get pessimistic. But I maintain that if you're, if you're really committed to liberty over the long term, uh, first of all, you, you have to just uh, mentally decide you're not going to be phased by the setbacks. But second, um, there's actually a lot of progress that's being made, especially if you're willing to look around the world at some of the, uh, the strides that are being made, and, um, and especially if you genuinely care for the liberty of, of everyone. And Magat, uh, did you want to chime in on some thoughts about how this group tends to be characterized? Yes, so just to put it simply, I used to be scared of you all for the longest time. You see, <laughs> having been raised in France, <laughs> I've been told that uh, folks like you, the freedom people of the United States, are among the scariest, especially for black people like me. So for the longest time, even when I moved to the U.S., after I, you know, it was really hard for me to even fly through places like Memphis. As my husband is here, for the longest time I would not even fly through the South, let alone a couple years ago we took our first road trip to the South for the first time. And I was telling him, Michael, are you crazy? Should we do this? Uh, the cops, if they stop us, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, you're silly now. And this is from somebody who travels the world. So for the longest time I was told that you guys here are the enemy and people like me should stay away from you. The heck the way from you. And I came to find that really none of that was true. It actually took me a few years before I even came to Freedom Fest. And instead, what have I found? What have I found in people like you? I have found the people who truly care. Because you see, the other side for the longest time used to tell me that they cared about me. And then eventually I realized that, oh, you care about me as long as your solution for me, in this case, let's talk about Africans and poor Africans, oh, we care about you, and you know what you need, you just need more socialism, you know those capitalist nasty people, all the reasons why you're where you are, and um, just to come to realize it was not true, actually, you're my best bet, you are my best bet, and it's not because, you know, you, it's not because you say, to heck with foreign aid, I came to learn that actually foreign aid was just that, a scam for that side to get even more richer with on top of that the virtue thing on their back. Yes, yeah, so you can see why we're, we're thrilled to have yeah. Magat working with us uh, for our work in Africa and this whole idea of you know, people that used to say, you know, oh, the liberty movement's about like, don't tread on me, yeah. but we love the idea of, you know, don't tread on anyone. We're about the freedom of all people. And, uh, and that's why we're talking about this session as sort of the anti-Davos. That's right. Well, yeah, one of the distinctions that uh, characterizes us as distinguished from the Davos crowd, we don't presume to know what's best for everybody else. Davos, we see it every year, the self-appointed elite, they fly in on their private jets in order to confer about what to do with the rest of us. And in particular, we're all told we should be consuming less producing less and consuming less, which is pretty easy to do when you get back on your private jet. <laughs> uh, their plans for us are invariably fueled with taxpayer dollars. That's the easy go-to source of money, and it's a catastrophe. Foreign aid is a disaster around the world. It has caused so much suffering and so much harm, and one of the worst impacts is it undermines democratic governmental accountability in other countries. Because politicians pay attention to who's paying the bills, and when those people are in Washington, New York, Paris, Tokyo, London, they're the ones who get the attention. But their own citizens are ignored. 
So it systematically undermines democracy, it undermines authentic economic growth, because what produces wealth is not government plans imposed on other people, it's free enterprise. It's people with an idea to start a business, people working, people investing and saving and creating things as Magad has done with her business in Senegal. That is the foundation of prosperity. It's what makes countries rich. So we get to work with really awesome people around the world who get it. They understand that prosperity is not delivered to you by a politician. It's something you create. And you create it when you have the freedom to manage your business, to start a business, to enter the market. So our approach is characterized by respect for other people's dignity. How they live and how they solve their problems is up to them. It's not up to me, it's not up to Magat or Brad or the World Bank or Joe Biden or anybody else. It's up to those people who have to live with the consequences, bear the costs or reap the benefits of the decisions that they make. So our partners around the world, around the United States, all over the planet, they live there and they see the problems, how hard it is to start a business, how much paperwork, what kind of taxes you have to pay, the obstacles that are put in their way, and then they systematically work to get rid of them. Because the key to prosperity is free enterprise, and that's bottom-up economic development. That's really our watchword. Yeah, and um, the, uh, the, you know, Tom was mentioning the amazing people that we get to work with. Like, they've been achieving amazing results, and uh, these are the people we're talking about. They, they run 576 independent organizations from 103 countries that all partner with Atlas Network with the same goal in mind, that you know, they're going to upset their priorities, but they're going to be the ones that are working in favor of freedom, looking for our network and from our team for different types of support to get better together. And the, among the awesome results that they've achieved, I'm thinking right now of in India, our partner there has helped legalize 38 million businesses that had not been recognized by the Indian government, that were often harassed by the Indian government. Um, in, uh, in, in Ukraine, with, what, whatever you think about the U.S. government or what it should be doing or not with the war, you'll be amazed at the partners there that we work with who've been able to put pro-growth tax policies on the agenda, getting that uh, embraced by the Zelensky administration with the idea that you need to kill corruption and you need to make Ukraine a place that can prosper on its own and not be reliant upon foreign governments when it comes to recover after what they've been through. In, in Chile, our partners were able to defeat a leftist attack on the pro-capitalist constitution that had helped Chile over decades become one of the most prosperous countries in the Americas. And then one that is really dear to my heart as, as a parent, um, I, I'm just so grateful for all the U.S. partners that we've been working with who've been involved in the school choice battles, which have been winning victories in West Virginia, in Arizona. There's a bunch of other states that are on the cusp of big things. And, um, and, and that uh, is just uh, really important for our movement. And what's important to recognize is that politicians were not the ones leading on this. The reason that we're where we are today on school choice and on these other battles that where we're seeing progress is because there are activists like you, there are researchers who are committed to principles that have been working years and years in order to achieve this change of heart and a change of mind about the best way forward. They're putting into practice the, uh, the, the principles that we all care about here, about individual liberty, free enterprise, limited government. And I, I hate that I have to add this to like, the enumerated list, because I thought it should be self-evident and taken for granted now, but, but free speech is another one that increasingly we're seeing our partners have to rise up and, and defend again. And that's why we were really excited to be on the stage yesterday to give one of our biggest awards to the group FIRE, which uh, you guys know as uh, a defender of free speech on campuses that have now gone beyond campuses. We recognize them with our North America Liberty Award, realizing that you know, the ACLU has become politicized. And while it used to be um, a, a respected arbiter of civil rights for everybody, um, they've changed. They've stepped back, and FIRE has stepped up into the fray. So how about a quick hand for our friends at FIRE again? 
And it's just one of the examples of big issues being taken on by our partners in the U.S. But as I said at the beginning, this is a global movement. Um, you can see the uh, distribution of our partners across the globe. Um, it's a, sort of an amazing community we work with. And Magat, you wanted to talk about one of our African partners, right? Yes, thank you so much. Yes, thanks for that opportunity, Brad. Um, just to put things into um, perspective and context for people, there is these partners we have been working with in Burundi. How many people here know Burundi? It's a tiny, tiny African nation, Central Africa. And there, it also happens to be one of the poorest countries in the world, unfortunately. And um, what have we done there with our partners, uh, with CDE uh, Great Lakes? We, they have profiled, today I think you have a chance to go um, during the Anthem Festival and look at this movie called Papa Coriandre. So Papa Coriandre is this guy in Burundi who started a beverage company. He invented this one really cool formu formula for a beverage and has been running his business, but then he's been, you know, going to jail, being ext facing extortion, basically being harassed by the government day in and day out. And eventually, in the face of that, our partner, CDE uh, Great Lakes, what they did is they went on to work on reforms. The, re the reason why this Papa Corian was being persecuted is simply because he happens to be doing business in a country that does not want people to do business, does not want people to uh, register their, bu their businesses legally. That, was, that is his crime. So what our partners did is they went on, went on to work on um, reforms to kind of turn that around. And today, hundreds of thousands of um, business, um, you know, creators are taking advantage of those reforms. So that's what we're talking about in terms of uh, let the local people identify their problems and also their solutions. We come on the back end to support with that. So when I say this crowd understands and cares, that's the type of care I care about. When you support organizations like Atlas so that they can turn around and support partners on the ground like CDE, Great Lakes, the whole thing works, and all the way down to the chain, you have Papa Coriandre, who can start his beverage business and hire up to more than 100 people. That's the type of change that, as an African, I want. And you do that, you're showing me that you truly care, and you truly respect me. That's there you it. Go. <laughs> Nicely said. And, uh, you know, one reason that we're, we're thrilled about this movie is that it really documents the impact of this partner we've been working with for several years, and it's a partner that has been recognized uh, in the recent past as one of our smart bets. The smart bets is a program that kind of has us acting like stock pickers, but for the, uh, the, the charitable community that favors free markets. So we identify 10 groups per year that we think are uh, important to, to, to highlight for those of you who want to see your philanthropic dollars actually produce some real impact for, for the free society. Um, the, uh, the CDE Great Lakes in Burundi was uh, one of our uh, class of uh, this past year. And just today, we announced the uh, the 10 that we're celebrating this year. They're uh, alphabetically listed on this slide. You'll note there's three groups that are from the U.S. The American Conservation Coalition has an amazing agenda that is pro-planet but also pro-people. Uh, the Badger Institute is one of the great state-based groups that we work with. It's doing important work on school choice and other topics in the swing state of Wisconsin. And then Free the People Foundation is reaching uh, new audiences with amazing stories about liberty. And then we're also bullish on the Center for Indonesian Policy Studies, Ideas Beyond Borders, which was founded by this amazing Iraqi freedom champion. Instituto OMG is from uh, the Domin Dominican Republic. Institute uh, Ostrom is from the Catalonia region of Spain. Liberty Sparks in Tanzania. Livres in Brazil. And Prometheus in Germany. Well, th one of the cool things, I get to work with these people, so I have a job that uh, it's just awesome, in my opinion, because I work with awesome, amazing people. Just think about Indonesia. What the Center for Indonesian Policy Studies did was they looked at why is it so hard to live there? Well, it's illegal to import food. Food prices are very, very high. And for the first time in the history of Indonesia since independence, they legalized the right to buy rice from Thailand, to buy food from abroad. This represented overnight a 25% increase in the real incomes of 68 million households in Indonesia. 
just by getting rid of a stupid, idiotic law that made it illegal to buy food from across the border, which, of course, some of the local businesses liked, but at the expense of the vast bulk of the population. That raised incomes. Welfare states do not. This actually helped people escape from poverty. And then in Brazil, government monopoly on water and sewage. Everyone has to pay, oddly enough, in poor neighborhoods, no clean water and no sewage service. And so Livre, as our partner there, changed the law to allow private companies to compete with the government, to allow private enterprise and private investment. And the consequence is water actually gets delivered and basic sanitation services are now delivered to people who never had that, although it was guaranteed by law through government monopolies that didn't produce. So they know how to actually get these things done. And um, thanks, Tom. And Brad, this makes me um, want to ask you to please share with people here, let them know that they actually can join us on this. Um, you know, we have, a, we have our gathering at the um, end of the year, and it's such a moment of celebration, I have to tell you, because all year long, all of us here, we're fighting, fighting for our rights, fighting to make sure that we, you know, preserve them and our freedom. And then during that time, it's really when you go and we're celebrating everything that was achieved by people in the U.S. and around the world. You walk out of those doors feeling like the heroes that you truly are. So, Brad, Tell us more about that. <laughs> I'm going to because pull up our is. last slide here, um, which gives you a QR code. Because, um, yeah, if we have managed to cheer you up a little bit in the 20 minutes we've been on stage, you should definitely come to, uh, to New York for our Liberty Forum and Freedom Dinner. Um, it, it, we don't have the, uh, the, the immense scale of activities going on in a bunch of different rooms the way that uh, the Skousens have done something remarkable here at Freedom Fest. But if you enjoy the people you meet here, you are going to love being in New York with us at Liberty Forum and Freedom Dinner especially when you see people that are working at great personal risk for these values around the world. So, yeah, use that QR code. There's a discount code. Just type in Freedom Fest in the discount code box, and you get 25% off if you do that today. So please uh, take advantage of that. Tom is doing a book signing later today on Development with Dignity, an amazing book on the revolution in development economics that our partners are a part of. As Magat mentioned, we've got Papa Coriander in the Anthem Film Fest. That's uh, 1 o'clock tomorrow, I believe, is the screening time for that one. And uh, in less than an hour, we have one more uh, session about disruptive technologies and what our partners are doing to make sure they wind up advancing freedom. So thanks for your attention and enjoy the rest of Freedom Fest. Thank you, Brad, Magat, Doctor. Give it up for him. Woo! Hi everyone, I have announcements. Have you been well behaved? No, you shouldn't be, you should live dangerously. Um, all right, well thank you so much to Atlas Network, Financial Tax Strategies, Why Refi, Judicial Watch, and Tax Foundation for being a part of Freedom Fest. We have a few options for our luscious lunch break. It's gonna start right now and we have several options on site. If you have tickets, uh, you can go to the meet and greet for Tulsi and Ennis. Uh, that is happening now or plan to join the Eurosport Vienna Vikings luncheon. I love Vikings. Uh, head over to the mezzanine level at the Sheraton. That sounds great. There's finally a luncheon kiosk available in the exhibit hall. You can visit uh, the Goldback booth at 500H or... You need some coins for your pockets, Universal Coin and Bullion. That is at Booth 500L if you want to join them for one of their upcoming hospitality events. And if you want more movies, and I know you do, we've got a very funny writer. His name is Paul Gway. He wrote the screenplay for Liar, Liar. I love a roast. Remember that? Jim Carrey is very funny. Uh, and he, he is headlining our comedy shorts during lunch. So you can head over to the Anthem Theater in Ballroom B, like ballroom, and you can uh, laugh your Tetons off. And don't miss our pair of films from Iran, Split Ends and Forbidden to See Us Speak in Tehran. That is at 310 and 330. Festival director Joanne Skousen says these films are stunning, so enjoy that. And we will see you back here for breakout sessions in all the rooms at 1.10 p.m. 
So you have an hour and change to go frolic and conquer. I will see you back here on the main stage at 4.30. And I'm wearing a special outfit, so we will crush it together. Thank you all. <gasps> Stop it right now. Lock away.